Well, well, well. Didn't expect to see you here. It's been a while since we've dropped anything Gravity Falls related, but then again, has anyone really ever stopped loving the Mystery Shack? If you've ever found yourself wondering about the unexplained mysteries of the universe, or following weird tracks through the woods, you've come to the right place. I've scrounged up some interesting information and put it all in one easy-to-digest video. We've got hundreds of Gravity Falls facts lifted from Channel Frederator's illustrious library all ready for your peepers to peep. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. I'm Keegan, and today we're going to take a long journey through the history of Gravity Falls. We've got timelines, we've got facts, we've got theories, we've even got some Mystery Shack souvenirs, if that's what you're into. Your reason for showing up no longer matters. Let's get into things. Let's start things off with a comprehensive look back at the history of Gravity Falls. How it came to be the way it is, you know, with all sorts of otherworldly stuff going on. There's a reason for everything, even if we can't quite explain it all. This timeline will hopefully answer Answer your questions before we get into the finer grit stuff. This is the complete Gravity Falls timeline, first published in January of 2019. It's no mystery, when it comes to the strange and unusual, Gravity Falls has got you covered. The Pines family first stole our hearts in 2012 and managed to keep us on the edge of our seats throughout the entirety of their mystery-filled journey. In fact, we here at Channel Frederator love the series so much that we've decided to revisit the series from the very beginning. And no, we're not talking about when Dipper and Mabel showed up we're talking the very beginning. I'm Jacob, and join me as we go through the series in chronological order. The good, the bad, and especially the mysterious. 30 million BCE. A massive flying saucer crash lands on our planet, forming the Valley of Gravity Falls and making it a hub of weirdness throughout history. 1000 AD. The first human natives of Gravity Falls flee the land for unknown reasons, leaving behind a treasure trove of ancient artifacts. Many of the artifacts depict the likeness of a certain one-eyed triangle, man. Eh, whatever, it's probably not important. 1837. Sir Lord Quentin Tremblay III Esquire is elected the eighth and a half president of the United States after winning the election in a literal landslide victory. He quickly becomes known as the country's silliest president, which is why you've never heard of him. 1842. Quentin Tremblay is kicked out of office and accidentally discovers the uncharted land of Gravity Falls after riding his horse backwards off a cliff. Quentin founds the settlement and deems himself mayor. 1862. Quentin Tremblay mysteriously disappears. The government initiates the Northwest cover-up and nominates local waste-shoveling village idiot Nathaniel Northwest to become the new town mayor in his stead. Northwest is also credited as the founder of Gravity Falls to further cover up Tremblay's existence. Late 1940s to the early 1950s. Twins Stanley and Stanford Pines are born in Glass Shard Beach, New Jersey to Phil Brick and Karen Pines. They're raised in the family pawn shop within the lead paint district of the city. Early 1960s. The two are an unstoppable pair with dreams of becoming full-time adventurers. Stanley develops a punch-first, ask-questions-later personality, which pairs perfectly with Ford's mental brilliance. While exploring their hometown of Glass Shard Beach, they find remnants of an old ship in a nearby cave. They begin to rebuild it, dubbing the boat the Stana War, and plan to use it to sail around the world together as treasure hunters. 1970s. During their senior year of high school, Stan and Ford are called to the principal's office, where they learn that Ford's science project has attracted the interest of West Coast Tech, a prestigious college. Ford is naturally excited about the opportunity, which upsets Stan since he's still holding onto their childhood dream of becoming treasure hunters. Frustrated over the idea of losing his brother, Stan accidentally damages Ford's science project, a perpetual motion machine, causing the project to malfunction and Ford to lose the opportunity of a lifetime. The two ultimately fall out, and Stan is kicked out of the family for losing them potential millions with Ford's inventions. Stan leaves home and starts his own business. Meanwhile, Ford enrolls in Backups More University to make up for his lost opportunity. 1972 to 1982, Stan's story. Stan found Stan Co enterprises and tries to sell poorly made household appliances. These faulty appliances give Stan a bad rap as he's soon considered a con man and chased out of New Jersey. Unfortunately, this becomes an ongoing trend for Stan as a traveling salesman. He's eventually banned from 32 of the 50 states, and also he's been in prison in three different countries. 1972 to 1982, Ford's story. Meanwhile, Ford works twice as hard as any other student at Backups More University. He's accepted into the doctoral program three years ahead of schedule, writes a thesis that becomes nationally ranked and receives an enormous grant for $100,000 to apply to his field of study. He decides to study the supernatural and shortly after moves to Gravity Falls, the weirdness capital of the country. Immediately, Ford is entranced by his findings. He begins to keep a record of his supernatural discoveries in a special journal. Soon enough, he realizes he needs to expand his studies and create a safe space to contain his more dangerous experiments, among which are things like the shapeshifter. So he constructs an extra bunker hidden underground beneath the Gravity Falls forest with a secret entrance inside an 
artificial tree. After a while, Ford hits a roadblock in his study. That is, until he stumbles across a cave filled with ancient writing. There's a ritual circle with various symbols and zodiac signs, seemingly for some sort of prophecy. Ford translates the writing to discover these are incantations carved next to a description of a triangular man with one eye and a top hat. However, a warning is also written, begging that these incantations never be said aloud. Ford ignores the warnings and summons the mysterious being who appears in his dream that night and introduces himself as Bill Cipher. Bill explains that he's a muse and he chooses one brilliant mind to inspire every century. The two become friends and in exchange for his knowledge of the other side, Bill asks for use of Ford's body whenever he should please, and Ford agrees. Bill gifts Ford the blueprints to build a portal to another dimension. To build it, Ford enlists the help of his old college friend, Fiddleford McGucket, who's specializing in personalized computers at this time. Fiddleford moves to Gravity Falls and assists Ford in building the portal. Once the portal's complete, Fiddleford is accidentally sucked inside. Ford saves him just in time, but it's obvious Fiddleford is frightened by what he's seen on the other side. He tells Ford to beware the beast with one eye, and warns him that his device will undoubtedly bring about the end of times. Fiddleford leaves and invents the Mind Erase Gun to help himself cope. He then founds a secret society called the Blind Eye, where he and a group of other townsfolk are determined to help others forget their disturbing supernatural findings. However, his words, the beast with one eye, make Ford suspicious, and he decides to confront Bill. When Bill admits his true plan is to merge both dimensions, Ford immediately shuts down the portal and begins taking precautions against Bill. He builds Project Mentum to encrypt his thoughts. He also begins to amend his previous journal entries with invisible ink, but that didn't seem like enough. So he abandons his research and hides his journals. He then converts his second underground bunker into a fallout shelter should the worst happen, and reaches out to the only person he knows he can trust, his twin brother, Stan. Late 1982. Stan arrives in Gravity Falls to see his brother for the first time in almost a decade. A crazed Ford explains that he needs Stan to take Journal 1 as far away from Gravity Falls as possible and keep it hidden. Since this is the only reason Ford wanted to see his estranged brother, Stan becomes enraged and the two fight. Stan pushes Ford into the portal and accidentally activates it. He then watches as Ford disappears into the gateway, but right before Ford vanishes, he tosses the journal to Stan. Stan tries everything he can to reactivate the gateway, but nothing works. When he goes into town, though, the townspeople think that he is actually Ford, you know, since they're twins. Stan runs with it and takes up his brother's identity, as well as the cabin he was living in. The townsfolk seem very curious about the cabin itself, so Stan turns this into his next big scam. He starts charging admission to the cabin, and thus, the Mystery Shack is born. August 31st, 1999. Finally, our protagonists, Mabel and Dipper Pines, are born in Piedmont, California. They're the grandchildren of Shermie Pines, Stan and Ford's younger brother. And now we arrive at the series itself. Hey, it's about time we got here. June 1st and 2nd, 2012. Tourist Trapped. Mabel and Dipper Pines arrive in Gravity Falls to spend the summer with their great uncle Stan, though the cool kids call him Grunk. Stan. He promptly puts them to work in the mystery shack. While posting signs in the woods, Dipper comes across a hollow tree. Inside, he finds an electronic device with one of its two wires severed. He fiddles with some switches, causing a trap door to open in the ground containing a mysterious journal marked 3. He opens the journal and sees it's filled with facts and notes about the town's strange supernatural anomalies. Meanwhile, Mabel announces she has a date, but her boyfriend Norman is actually a bunch of gnomes looking to take Mabel as their queen. Dipper rescues his sister, and the twins return to the mystery shack. June June 3rd, 2012, Legend of the Gobblewonker. Grunkle Stan takes the twins fishing at Gravity Falls Lake, where a crazed hick the locals refer to as Old Man McGucket claims to have seen a lake monster. Once Seuss, the Mystery Shack handyman, arrives with his own boat, the twins decide to ditch their Grunkle's lame jokes and investigate. They discover that the lake monster is actually a mechanical creation of Old Man McGucket's. June 10th to 13th, 2012, The Hand That Rocks the Mabel. The twins learn that Grunkle Stan's biggest competition in town is an adorable little boy named Gideon Gleeful, aka Lil Gideon, a local psychic adored by all the townsfolk. Dipper and Mabel attend one of his shows to test his psychic abilities, and Dipper concludes that Gideon is nothing more than a con man, just like their grunkle. The next day, Gideon arrives at the shack to ask Mabel if she wants to come to his dressing room and try on some different makeup. The two become friends until he reveals he has a crush on her. The feeling isn't mutual, though, so they have a falling out, and Gideon swears revenge on the Pines family. Later that night, it's revealed that Gideon is in possession of Journal 2. June 17th, 2012, Irrational Treasure. It's Pioneer Day at Gravity Falls, and the twins uncover evidence that the town's founder, Nathaniel Northwest, is a hoax. They set out to uncover the truth, ultimately so they can rub it into the insanely wealthy and entitled Pacifica Northwest's face. She's the town's popular mean girl and a descendant of the supposed founder. While following a set of clues, they discover the government's Northwest
West cover-up, along with the original mayor, Quentin Tremblay, preserved in peanut brittle. Turns out Tremblay disappeared because he wanted to demonstrate peanut brittle's life-sustaining properties. June 18th, 2012, the time traveler's pig. Grunkle Stan throws a mystery fair where Mabel wins a pig by correctly guessing its weight. She names him Waddles and makes him her new best friend. Shortly after, the twins run into Blendon Blandon, a time traveler on a mission to clean up disturbances in the timeline. They take the time machine and go back in time, which results in Blendon getting arrested by the Time Paradox Avoidance Enforcement Squadron. While apprehended, he swears to get revenge on the twins. June 20th, 2012, Little Dipper. Gideon attempts to exact revenge on the Pines by taking ownership of the Mystery Shack, but Grunkle Stan out cons the little con man. Gideon later reveals that he doesn't just want the shack, he wants something hidden on the property. July to August 2012, Dreamscaperers. Gideon summons Bill Cipher to make a deal. He requests that Bill retrieve the combination to Stan's secret safe so he can steal the deed to the shack. Dipper, Mabel, and Seuss witness the demon enter Stan's mind. To save Stan, they use Journal 3 to find the necessary incantations to follow Bill into Stan's mind. They face off against Bill and return to reality with their grunkle safe, but Gideon manages to break into the safe using dynamite. Dynamite. He steals the lease and kicks the Pines family out. Gideon rises. The Pines family are living with Seuss and his grandma, Abuelita, which is less than glamorous. It's no mystery shack. Gideon reveals that his true plan is to find the first journal on the property. Dipper and Mabel seek out the gnomes from the first episode for help, but Gideon turns the gnomes against the twins. With the help of his gnome allies, Gideon retrieves journal three from Dipper. Afterwards, Dipper gives up and the twins board a bus back to California. That's when Gideon realizes the journal he retrieved from Dipper is actually Journal 3, not 1. He thought there were only two. He chases the bus they were on back into Gravity Falls with his Gideon bot, built by McGucket of course, and faces off against the twins. The townsfolk arrive, ready to arrest the twins for harming Gideon, but before they do, Stan reveals that the free Gideon pins everyone received were actually cameras he used to spy on them. Gideon gets arrested, and the Pines family gets their shack back. Dipper tells Stan about the journals, and Stan, up to this point playing dumb about all the weirdness of Gravity Falls to the kids, takes the third one from Dipper claiming he wants to borrow it for inspiration for the shack. That night, Stan sneaks into his secret room behind the vending machine, which takes him down to Ford's old lab. Stan is now in possession of all three journals. Cut to black, season one over. Scary Oki. Stan continues working hard on the portal, but it attracts the attention of some government agents who begin to snoop around. The Pines family prepares for their grand reopening party, but then Dipper accidentally raises the dead. It happens. The agents run off and the zombies attack the shack. After Stan tells Dipper that he's known about the strangeness of Gravity Falls all along, he, Mabel, and Dipper destroy the zombies after discovering their weakness is very loud karaoke music. Into the bunker. Dipper, Mabel, Seuss, and Wendy follow the journal to a secret bunker hidden in the woods, right under the hollow tree where Dipper originally found the journal. Inside, they battle a shapeshifter that has escaped its cage. On their way out, Seuss finds a briefcase he took from the lab is actually an old laptop belonging to someone identified as F. Society of the blind eye. Dipper discovers the laptop is marked McGucket Lab, so they rush to crazy old man McGucket's junkyard to confront him. Unfortunately, McGucket claims that he's had amnesia since 1982. They read about the Society of the Blind Eye in the journal and conclude that McGucket must have had his mind erased after witnessing something. Based on a few clues and what McGucket can remember, they're led to the Society's secret headquarters, where they discover a persistent initiative to erase the townsfolk's memories. The gang retrieves the mind erased gun and uses it to erase the cult's memory. They also find McGucket's old memory tube and discover McGucket is the founder of the Blind Eye Society and that the laptop was his. Not only that, he was in Gravity Falls assisting the journal's author in a groundbreaking experiment that disturbed him so deeply he began erasing his own memory to the point of deterioration. Not what he seems. Stan continues to secretly work on the portal, but government agents arrive again to take him into custody for stealing drums of toxic chemicals. Dipper and Mabel attempt to clear his name with security footage, only to discover that he is in fact guilty. They also discover the lab, along with the portal, and all three journals. Dipper scans the journals with a black light to reveal a secret message about the portal, that it could destroy the entire universe. Stan escapes custody and runs back to the shack, only to be confronted by the twins in the lab. Dipper activates the manual override and threatens to shut the portal down. As the room loses gravity, everyone is lifted into the air, but Mabel manages to grab the override button. Stan begs Mabel not to push it, but Dipper tells her to press it, since Stan has has been lying to them this whole time about his true intentions. As the countdown nears its end, Mabel decides to trust her grunkle, and when the timer runs out, the portal is activated, and a mysterious figure appears. A Tale of Two Stands. The twins learn of their second grunkle, Ford, the long-sought
sought out author of the journals. Ford and Stan tell the twins of their falling out, recalling the events that have led up to now and why Stan was posing as Ford this entire time. The government agents arrive again to take Stan back into custody, but Dipper uses McGucket's mind erase gun to clear their memories. The last Mabel Corn. Bill appears to Ford in a dream and tells him he knows about the interdimensional rift that was created when the portal was reactivated. So Ford dismantles the portal, contains the rift, and warns his family to protect the shack. If Bill gets his hands on the portal or rift, he can open the doorway to his dimension and unleash chaos. At this point, the twins have had more than a few run-ins with Bill Cipher, so they know that this isn't a threat to take lightly. Luckily, Ford knows a way to shield the shack from Bill, but it requires unicorn hair. So Mabel volunteers to retrieve it along with her friends Wendy, Candy, and Grenda. Meanwhile, Ford formulates a backup plan to protect their minds using Project Mentum. Dipper uses the device to encrypt his thoughts while Ford naps, but his curiosity leads him to place the helmet on Ford's head. Dipper uncovers memories of the deal between Ford and Bill, which makes him believe that they're still working together. He threatens to erase Ford's mind, thinking that Bill is actually in possession of his body, but Ford assures Dipper it's okay and tells him of what happened between him and Bill all those years ago. Mabel and the girls finally return with the magical hair after a nasty altercation with the unicorns and use it to set up the shield. Dipper and Mabel versus the future. Mabel begins planning for her and Dipper's big 13th birthday party, while Dipper ventures out with Ford to fix the cracking interdimensional rift. They travel down to Crash Site Omega, where the ancient alien ship crash landed, to find an alien adhesive to patch the rift. On their search, Ford offers Dipper an apprenticeship and asks that he stay in Gravity Falls after the summer is over. Dipper excitedly accepts, but unbeknownst to him, Mabel overheard the agreement over their shared walkie-talkies. Dipper excitedly returns home to tell Mabel about the offer, but she tells him how upset losing him would be when she has to go back to school without him. After an emotionally charged exchange, she grabs her backpack and runs into the woods in a huff. Suddenly, Blendon Blandon appears and offers to extend summer for her forever so she never has to leave. All he wants in return is the interdimensional rift, which just so happens to be in the backpack that she grabbed. It turns out she grabbed Dipper's bag by mistake. She makes the deal with Blendon and to her dismay, realizes he was possessed by Bill the whole time. Bill then destroys the rift, unleashing his world upon ours. Weird Mageddon parts one through three. Bill's nightmare realm has taken over Gravity Falls. Dipper and Ford find themselves in a race against time to defeat Bill before his weirdness spreads across the entire world. Bill manages to capture Ford and burn the three journals, but Dipper escapes before he can do any more damage. Elsewhere, Gideon, who's been in a maximum security prison since season one, breaks free during the madness and races to save Bill. Dipper travels to the mall where he reunites with Wendy and the two decide to go after Mabel. However, Gideon and his gang of discount auto warriors intervene. Gideon places them under arrest and the two groups fight wheel to wheel in a Mad Max style race. Gideon catches our heroes, but sets them free when Dipper calls him out on all the horrible things he's done and why Mabel will never love him back. Now freed from Gideon's grasp, Seuss, Dipper, and Wendy travel to Mabel's prison to help her escape, but once inside, they realize it's less of a prison and more of a cute fantasy land dubbed Mabel Land. The land is designed to lull its prisoners into a false sense of security by giving them exactly what they desire most. Dipper is left alone to rescue Mabel, but once he finds her, she tells him that she doesn't want to leave. Mabel arranges a trial for Dipper to state his case, and Dipper convinces her that while reality can be disappointing, no matter what happens, they have each other. Dipper assures Mabel that he'll never leave her side, and they finally escape Mabel Land together. After reuniting with Wendy and Seuss, they head back to the Mystery Shack. The barrier Ford placed on the shack has protected it during the frenzy, making it a safe haven for locals and mystical creatures alike. Dipper convinces Stan and the refugees that they have to rescue Ford in order to defeat Bill. Meanwhile, Bill realizes he can't expand his weirdness barrier beyond Gravity Falls, so he unfreezes Ford for answers. Ford claims it's due to the natural weirdness magnetism in Gravity Falls caused by the alien ship. There is a way to break through, but you'll never tell him, of course. Meanwhile, McGucket has converted the shack into a giant battle mech of sorts, and they head toward Bill's Pyramid to face him. Once inside, the refugees battle it out with Bill's henchmen. He freezes Ford once more and attacks the shack, but can't break through the unicorn barrier. The newly dubbed Shackatron rips Bill's eye out, causing him to take some time to regenerate. Mabel grabs the Ford statue, and Gideon tells her how to unfreeze all of the frozen townsfolk. All the townsfolk are changed back to normal, including Ford. Ford then grabs a can of blue spray paint and begins to paint the Zodiac on the ground, including all ten symbols that represent ten of the characters there today. It's all a part of the prophecy he discovered years ago that was carved into the wall of the ancient natives. They all stand on their respective symbols and hold hands to create a ring of energy around the Zodiac. Stan refuses to complete the circle, though, until Ford thanks him for bringing him back to this realm. Ford eventually does thank him, but considering the circumstance, it's kind of forced. Unfortunately, the tension between the brothers runs too high and a fight breaks out between 
between the two. As a result, the barrier is broken and Bill returns. Bill burns the Zodiac away, captures Stan and Ford, and chases the twins throughout the pyramid. Inside their cage, Stan and Ford lament over their fighting. Ford decides to let Bill inside his mind to learn how to escape Gravity Falls so the twins can be saved. Bill happily enters his mindscape, only to discover that, oh, it's not Ford's mind, it's Stan's. He disguised himself in order for Ford to erase his memory with Bill inside. Ford destroys Bill, and the portal to the Nightmare Realm closes. August 31st, 2012. Gravity Falls is back to normal, or as normal as it can be, including Stan, who took a little time to regain his memory after having it wiped by Ford. The entire town gets together for Dipper and Mabel's 13th birthday, Ford and Stan make up, and Ford asks Stan to accompany him on an adventure to investigate anomalies out in the Arctic Ocean and finally live out their childhood dream. Stan agrees and promotes Seuss to the manager of the Mystery Shack, and Abuelita moves in immediately. September 1st, 2012 and onwards. At some point in the near future, Stan and Ford are adventuring into the Arctic Sea aboard the Stan o War 2, and Seuss runs the Mystery Shack. The Northwests lose their mansion due to a risky investment in weirdness bonds, and McGuckin moves in instead, and the twins say their goodbyes and head back to Piedmont, California, ending the greatest summer of their lives. Holy moly, that timeline got 11 million views? Well, how much did this next one get? 12. I gotta say, Gravity Falls has a grip on the denizens of the internet unlike anything else. Folks just love the characters, the setting, the music, the monsters, and of course, the secrets. All of these things and more can be found in our next video, 107 Gravity Falls Facts You Should Know. Mabel and Dipper Pines are having the craziest summer vacation ever in the quirky town of Gravity Falls, Oregon. Working at their Grunkle Stan's tourist trap, the Mystery Shack, the Pines twins stumble upon some bigger secrets this town is hiding and quickly learn that things are definitely not what they seem. I'm Emily, and here on Channel Frederator, we're going to give you 107 facts about Gravity Falls. Number one, a reoccurring number in the series, 618, June 18th, is actually creator Alex Hirsch's birthday. It's also his twin sister's birthday, which makes sense because they're twins. Number two, speaking of Alex and his twin sister, Ariel, Dipper and Mabel are loosely based on the siblings. Mabel's love for boy bands came from Ariel's obsession with NSYNC. Lance Bass was her band member of choice, which is why Alex asked him to come and voice some members of several times. Number three. Seuss is based off of Jesus Chambrot, who is a friend of Alex Hirsch. They attended Cal Arts together, and Alex notes that Jesus was of indeterminate age. We knew that he was a few years older than the rest of my friends at Cal Arts, but we never knew how old for sure. Number four, not only is Alex Hirsch the creator of Gravity Falls, He's also the voice of Grunkle Stan. You got no muscles, you smell like baby wipes. Seuss. Oh man, I'm so glad I turned my head. Bill Cipher. I have a head that's always screaming. And reoccurring characters like Old Man McGucket. I'm Old Man McGucket. And the gnomes. Steve, Jason, and I'm sorry, I always forget your name. Schmerbulock. Number five. What the H? The letter H is a reoccurring symbol in Gravity Falls and may be a nod to creator Alex Hirsch's last name. Number six. During the end credits of each episode, there is a cryptogram. The cryptograms in episodes 1 through 6 utilize the Caesar cipher. Episodes 7 through 13 utilize the Atbash cipher. Episodes 14 through 19 utilize the A1Z26 cipher. Episode 20 utilizes a combined cipher. Episodes 21 and on utilize the Visionaire cipher. Number 7. Listening to the whisper at the end of the theme song in reverse gives you a clue on how to solve the ciphers. <laughs> Number eight, Alex Hirsch writes all of the ciphers himself, and they're usually inserted last minute. That is it, <laughs> comedy gold. I love it. Number nine, Bill Cipher takes on the form of the Eye of Providence, also known as the All-Seeing Eye of God. Number 10, the cave Dipper is seen exploring in the theme song has what appears to be ruins on the wall. Upon closer inspection though, one character doesn't match up with any known ruins, and the others have no translatable meaning. <laughs> Number 11. All three journals shown have maze pages that fit in with one another. Number 12. In the animated short Stan's Tattoo, Dipper tries to solve the mystery of what Stan's tattoo is. Stan denies that he has a tattoo. I don't, but you do. What do you mean I- ah! But in other episodes, it can be seen on the right side of his back. Bill Cipher has said that Stan's tattoo actually means watch your back. Number 13. Alex's sister Ariel had a lime green troll doll sweater in elementary school. That helped inspire Mabel's assorted array of colorful sweaters. Hirsch also felt that because Mabel is so fun loving and bubbly, we had the dance party for no reason! Go, go, go. 
she wouldn't be constrained to wearing the same outfit in every episode, like most cartoon characters. Washing clothes is a waste of time! I'm a busy guy! Number 14. Wrinkle Stan is based on Alex Hirsch's real Grandpa Stan. Number 15. Colleen Stan Pine's Grunkle Stan was inspired by Alex Hirsch's great aunt Lois. She referred to herself as Gronty Lois. Number 16. When she was young, Ariel Hirsch wanted a pet pig. This inspired Alex Hirsch to give Mabel her beloved pet, Waddles. Did you say Mabel or Doorbell? <laughs> <laughs> Number 17. Waddles was named by Ari Wallington, a writer on the show. He was named after the pet pig she had when she was growing up. Every year her family would raise a pig named Waddles, which would then be cooked and eaten. Hopefully Mabel's Waddles doesn't share the same fate. Number 18. The location of Gravity Falls was inspired by Boring, Oregon. Hirsch's family would sometimes pass the town on road trips. Though they never visited, Gravity Falls is what Hirsch imagines Boring might be like, or that it might be the opposite of what Boring is. Number 19. When Waddles eats mushroom powder that morphs him into a super genius, he constructs a machine for himself that allows him to talk. Greetings, friends. It is I, Waddles the Pig. The genius voice behind that genius pig? Neil deGrasse Tyson, of course. Number 20. Kristen Shaw was Alex Hirsch's absolute choice to play Mabel from the get-go. She was such an integral part of his vision that Alex has said, I would have just stopped working if we hadn't gotten her. I would have probably quit. Number 21. Kristen actually cosplayed as Mabel for San Diego Comic Con in 2013. She said that all of the characters she's played, Mabel is the closest to her actual self. Number 22. Alex's sister, Ariel Hirsch, was a guest star in the episode Boys Crazy. She played Pacifica Northwest's fuchsia-haired friend. He was talking to me! Ah! Number 23. Matt Chapman, a former writer on Gravity Falls, is co-creator and primary voice actor on Homestar Runner. Strong bad, get off my property! I hate you, Grunkle Stan! Shut up your face! Number 24. Ariel and Alex Hirsch both grew up in Piedmont, California, which is also where Mabel and Dipper are from. Number 25. Jason Ritter, the voice of Dipper, almost wasn't the voice of Dipper. He recorded for the pilot, but committed to another show while Gravity Falls was waiting to be picked up. Lucky for us, the other show got cancelled and Ritter was able to take on Dipper again. Number 26. The art director of Gravity Falls, Ian Worrell, is Alex Hirsch's college roommate. Number 27. Mabel once had to go to the hospital for eating scratch and sniff stickers. Number 28. Dipper's favorite band is a nerd rock group called The Bad First Impressions. Alex Hirsch describes them as they might be giants-ish. Number 29. Secretly, Dipper also listens to top 40 hits and the Icelandic pop group BABBA. BABBA is, of course, a parody of the 70s Swedish pop group ABBA. Their song, Disco Girl, is a parody of ABBA's Dancing Queen. Number 30. Uncle Stan has been practicing the same coin trick since 1982. He still hasn't gotten it. Number 31. Wendy and Robbie met at a fifth grade birthday party. Robbie pulled Wendy's pink tails and she socked him in the face. He ended up with a chipped tooth. Robbie remembers the incident, but Wendy does not. Number 32. Seuss's role models are Grunkle Stan and his Abuelita. I vacuum the walls now. He also looks up to wrestler Terry America. Number 33. One of the Manitars is named after a full-size taxidermy buffalo that Alex Hirsch keeps in his office at Disney. Dubbed Beardy, Hirsch has said that he insists people sit on it when they take tours of the studio. Number 34. Between the first and second seasons of Gravity Falls, the creative team behind the show took a road trip up the coast of Oregon. They stopped at every tacky tourist attraction they could find and were surprised by how closely they'd capture more subtle aspects of these gimmicky stops with the mystery shack. Number 35. According to Alex Hirsch, Dipper is secretly jealous that Mabel is more socially adept than him. Whoop, 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 whoop. Number 36. Hirsch has actually made several appearances on the show as himself. In the opening theme, the bottom half of his face can be seen amongst other photos. A caricature of him can be seen in the episode Bottomless Pit, Riding the Unicycle. On Dipper's author board in the episode Society of the Blind Eye, a photo of him can be seen with other suspicious town folks accompanied by the word who? Number 37. The birthmark Dipper has on his forehead was inspired by a classmate of Alex Hirsch who, quote, had horrendous acne. That's how you got your nickname. I thought your parents just hated you or something. Alex would often map out constellations using his pimples. One day, his classmate had a perfect Big Dipper on his forehead. Number 38. At the show's start, writers frequently and incorrectly assumed that Mabel and Dipper didn't get along. Oh, hey, what's that? Huh? This led to Alex Hirsch coming up with the Ten Commandments of how Dipper and Mabel act around one another. He's 15! 
Ten Commandments! No, there is no literal Ten Commandments, but there are some rules he often goes over with the writers. The first being, the kids like each other. No matter how much they get on each other's nerves, this never changes. Number 39. Another interesting rule, which also serves as a fun fact, is that Dipper wants to grow up too fast, and Mabel doesn't. Number 40. The series of Gravity Falls takes place over the course of one summer. Number 41. Dipper is actually just a nickname stemming from Dipper's birthmark. He's been referred to as Dipper since he was no more than five years old. The character's real first name has yet to be confirmed, though it may be Roderick, as Quentin Tremblay calls him that in the episode Irrational Treasure. Jeff Rowe, a writer on the show, once tweeted that Dipper's real name is Lominic, like Dominic, but tragically misspelled since birth. Number 42. The original cipher at the end of Dreamscapers was, next week, Xyler and Kraz's Bodexcellent Rad Adventure. Number 43. Mabel is the older twin by a mere five minutes. She brings us up now and then to Dipper's annoyance. She is also one millimeter taller than her brother. Come on, guys. Nobody even uses millimeters. It only makes you taller than me in Canada. Number 44. Dipper and Mabel's middle names are their parents' first names. Number 45. David Lynch was offered the role of Bill Cipher, but he declined. Alex Hirsch resorted to voicing the character with a bad impression of him. Oh, oh, Gravity Falls, it is good to be back. Number 46. Mabel has a crush on Alexander Hamilton, otherwise known as the man on the $10 bill. Impeccable taste in the founding fathers, Mabel. Number 47. Wendy Corduroy's favorite color is flannel. Number 48. Though their identities are unknown, Wendy is based on several different people. Number 49. Bill Cipher has done his own AMA on Reddit. Number 50. Similar to how Dipper is jealous of her social skills, Mabel is envious of Dipper's academic prowess. I guess it's that you're better at me at like everything. Number 51. When Mabel has nightmares, she meows herself back to sleep. <laughs> Number 52. Seuss's middle and last name are references to Gravity Falls storyboard artist Alonzo Ramirez Ramos. Number 53. If a blanket is placed over Seuss's head, he falls asleep, much like a canary. Number 54. At the Gravity Falls 2014 San Diego Comic Con panel, it became known that Seuss's father is Caucasian and his mother is Hispanic. Number 55. Seuss is the only main character without a criminal record. Mabel and Dipper have been locked up for counterfeiting, Stan has committed too many crimes to count, and Wendy and her friends have been busted for stealing a cop car. Number 56. What exactly was Alex Hirsch doing when he first thought of Gravity Falls? In his words, I was walking up Vermont Avenue in Los Feliz between the post office and House of Pies when the name Gravity Falls popped into my head. It was such a dumb, corny joke that naturally I never forgot it and had to develop a whole TV show around it. The moral here is, if you want TV show ideas, go to the House of Pies. Number 57. Alex Hirsch has confirmed that Wendy's mother is no longer with her. Number 58. If Alex Hirsch could have any guest star on the show, it would be Jon Stewart. Ironically, Stewart has said on a segment of his show, while jokingly denying that he watches cartoons, he said that Gravity Falls has all of these incredible plot lines. The shout out was much appreciated by Alex on Twitter. Number 59. Dipper is ambidextrous, though he tends to use his right hand more than his left. Number 60. At the end of the show's theme song, an image is flashed, which shows Bill Cipher, a wheel, and various symbols and writings. The wheel has 10 images around its outer edge, with each image being related to an element of the show. As of now, it's speculated that the glasses represent the author, the question mark represents Seuss, the crescent-like symbol represents Stan, the pine tree represents Dipper, the star represents Gideon, the hand with six fingers is tied to the journals, the shooting star represents Mabel, and the heart with the stitch represents Robbie. However, the open bag of ice and the llama are still open to speculation, though Dipper has retrieved ice for his friends on multiple occasions. Number 61. The Konami code can be seen in the same image towards the bottom right. Number 62. Stan's favorite treat is toffee peanuts. Number 63. The background of a flashback in Dreamscapers reveals that Stan grew up in New Jersey. Number 64. Dipper can play the sousaphone. Number 65. When Dipper gets super sleep deprived, he unknowingly starts to eat his own shirt. Number 66. He is also ticklish under his arm. Number 67. Stan owns 10 guns, and his appearance hasn't changed at all in the last 10 years. Number 68. All the fingerprints on Stan's right hand have a double loop whirl pattern. Number 69. When Alex Hirsch was 12, he took a trip to Florida, where he was subjected to watching the same infomercial for the car dealership, Family Auto Mart. Family Auto Mart. 
about a hundred times. He remembers the song from the ads to this day and was inspired by them to create Bud Gleeful. Number 70. Bill Cipher's favorite song is apparently 10 hours of rising shepherd tone. Number 71. Bill Cipher claims that life tastes like uracil, cytosine, and thymine. He dislikes it. Boy, these arms are durable. Number 72. Gideon's design is based off of televangelist Benny Hinn. Number 73. According to Alex Hirsch, Gideon's skin is so soft because he steals Wendy's moisturizer. Number 74. Gideon Gleeful is a play on the phrase Gideon Gleeful. Number 75. Robbie V secretly draws anime. No shame, Robbie. But you and Ronaldo from Steven Universe should hang out. Number 76. Robbie has known Thompson for at least 10 years. The same goes for Wendy and Tambry. Number 77. He doesn't like people knowing, but Thompson once ate a waffle that had been run over for 50 cents. Thompson! Thompson! Number 78. Brad Breek is a songwriter and composer for Gravity Falls. Dan Cantrell and Neil Cesariga of Potter Puppet Pals and Lemon Demon fame were also in the running. Number 79. Neil Cesariga's younger sister, Emmy Cesariga, is a storyboard artist on the show. Number 80. Wendy wants to live in Portland. Number 81. Seuss writes fan fiction about Stan and keeps a photo of him on the break room door. Well, this is getting weird. Number 82. In the commercial for the Gravity Falls Subway Kids Meals, Mabel may not sound much like herself. That's because she wasn't voiced by Kristen Schaal. Number 83. Mabel once fed baby birds using her mouth. She must be really in tune with her inner mama bird. Number 84. In the episode Double Dipper, it's mentioned that Dipper has always wanted the name Tyrone, which makes you wonder what his real name is. I will call you number two. Definitely not. Number 85. In spring 2007, while at CalArts, Alex Hirsch created a short called Off the Wall. An animation executive at Disney, Mike Moon, eventually saw it and approached Alex about pitching an animated series. And I think we all know how that story ends. Number 86. Stan has a box of fake IDs and passports. Some of his not real identities include Hal Forrester, Andrew Eight Ball Alcatraz, and Stetson Pinefield. Number 87. Alex Hirsch once leaked a fake photo of Old Man McGucket writing in the journals. This fooled a lot of fans into thinking that Old Man McGucket was the author. Number 88. The reoccurring goat in the series is named Gompers after American Federation of Labor leader Samuel Gompers. Speaking of Gompers, Bill Cipher has said that he likes Gompers better this way. Better than what way? There be secrets afoot. Enjoy it while you can, Stan. They'll find out sooner or later. Number 89. If you get some of those Twin Peaks flashbacks while watching Gravity Falls, this is no coincidence. The show is chock full of references to David Lynch's acclaimed series. Look for episodes like Club Club in the Gravity Falls episode, The Hand That Rocks Mabel. Number 90. Dipper wrote a theme song for himself that he sings in the shower. That girl is you. Don't come in, don't come in. Number 91. Pacifica Northwest's name is a pun on the Pacific Northwest region of the US. The Pacific Northwest contains Oregon, which within the show's realm contains Gravity Falls. So Pacifica Northwest is from the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> We're perfect. Number 92. Bill Cipher wants to see Dipper stick jalapeno peppers in his eyes. That's oddly specific, but characteristically sadistic. Number 93. Despite the fact that her designs always incorporate mass amounts of purple, Pacifica's favorite color is pink. Number 94. On his Reddit AMA, Bill Cipher was asked if he had a family. He replied, not anymore. What does that mean? Number 95. Bill Cipher responded to everything on his AMA in caps lock because according to him, he thinks in capital letters. Reality is an illusion. The universe is a hologram. Bye, Cole. Bye. Number 96. Quentin Tremblay is Alex Hirsch's favorite character to voice. Probably because he's so cray cray. Number 97. Quentin Tremblay is based off of President Theodore Roosevelt as he appeared in one of Alex Hirsch's student films. Number 98. Pit Cola, which appears in almost every episode of Gravity Falls, is named after one of the show's directors, Joe Pitt. I'm gonna drink it like a person! <laughs> Number 99. The brand of the TV in the Mystery Shack is Worrell. This comes from production artist Ian Worrell's name. Number 100. Gravity Falls' main theme is often confused with Made Me Realize from MTV's show Awkward, which Brad Breek also wrote. Though they're similar, Breek has stated on his website that they are not related or even the same. Number 101. 
The Paul Bunyan statue seen in the theme song is a reference to the Paul Bunyan statue from the Trees of Mystery roadside attraction in Oregon. Number 102. If you're wondering where Gravity Falls is, why don't you search it on Google Maps? It'll point you to the Oregon Vortex. Number 103. The shapeshifter was inspired by John Carpenter's The Thing. It was also inspired by Clayface from Batman the Animated Series. And also a Vietnamese spring roll that designer Robert Tree and Corey ate in 2001. Number 104. Chuck's Bar's tattoo is the astrological symbol for Mars. Number 105. Old Man McGucket's original name was Crazy Larry. His full name is Fiddleford Harden Old Man McGucket, with Harden being a reference to a class of subatomic particles. Number 106. Alex Hirsch has joked on both Reddit and Twitter that the author of the journals is actually Jordy LaForge from Star Trek The New Generation. Of course, those of us that are fully up to date on Gravity Falls know that the author is actually number 107. The author of the journals. Grunkle Stan's long lost twin brother. Is this the part where one of us faints? Obviously, we can't cover everything there is to know in just 107 facts. So, Channel Frederator cataloged 107 more and called it 107 Gravity Fall Facts You Should Know Part 2. Get after it. When Gravity Falls burst onto the animation scene in 2012, we couldn't get enough of Dipper Pines and his twin sister Mabel. So how could 107 piddly little facts ever be enough for this beloved but all too brief animated adventure? It couldn't! That's why we've compiled 107 more facts you should know about Gravity Falls. Think you know everything there is to know about the Pines twins, Grunkle Stan, and the rest of the Gravity Falls universe? Inconceivable! So sit back, grab some snacks, and get ready to get your learn on. Just a warning, some of these facts could be a little spoilery, so proceed at your own risk. Number one. When asked for an alternate title for the show, creator Alex Hirsch answered, Big Trouble in Little Oregon. Number two. For the test short, Disney commissioned Canada animation studio House of Cool Incorporated to complete the animation. The studio used Adobe Flash, which gave it a more static and limited feel, reminiscent of hand-drawn animation like DuckTales and The Simpsons. Number three. According to storyboard artist Matt Braley, final animation was created overseas at an animation studio in Korea. Number Number four. Hirsch didn't initially intend to voice the characters on the show. When it finally came down to casting the characters, others, including himself, felt that he was perfect for the characters of Grunkle Stan and Seuss Ramirez. Number five. Hirsch has commented that the large number of fans who correctly guessed the existence of Stan's twin brother contributed to the timing of Ford's entrance. Number six. Ford's existence was planned from the very beginning of the series, and many clues have been sprinkled throughout the series. One example, Stan's license having the wrong name as early as episode two. Number seven. This twin brother device wouldn't have gone over very well with the cast of the show itself, who become outraged when a similar unveiling occurs in their favorite show, Duck Detective. Number eight. Grunkle Stan's actual name is Stanley. He stole his brother Stanford's identity when Stanford got sucked into the interdimensional portal during a fight. Number nine. While eating snacks one night, Stan Pines accidentally broke his brother's science fair experiment that would guarantee him a fantastic education. This ruined Ford's chances of getting into West Coast tech. Instead, he went to a community college called Back Up Some More. University. Number 10. Stan's brother Ford came to Gravity Falls to study anomalies, claiming he found more anomalies existed in this area than anywhere else in the states. Number 11. Ford fell into the portal somewhere in the mid to late 80s, so he existed in another dimension for about 30 years. Number 12. Fiddle Ford McGucket would have been better off had he stayed in his garage in Palo Alto and kept working on personal computers. This is a nod to Steve Jobs who invented Apple computers in, you guessed it, a garage in Palo Alto. Number 13. Ford summoned Bill when he hit a roadblock with his research. Bill tricked him into trusting him as a friend and gave him the knowledge needed to build the portal to bridge his nightmare realm with our world. Number 14. Ford's assistant Fiddleford is none other than crazy old man McGucket. Number 15. When Fiddleford dipped into the portal, he saw, quote, the kinds of places where Bill Cipher likes to hang out, and his mind was permanently damaged. Number 16. To try to rid himself of the horrifying visions, McGucket started the Blind Eye Society and invented the memory erasing gun to help himself and others forget the unwanted memories. And yes, 
yes, there's a direct correlation between that device and McGucket losing his mind. Number 17. Want to defend your home from Bill Cipher? You'll need three moonstones, mercury, and a lock of unicorn hair. And we haven't seen Bill go inside the mystery shack yet, so it might have actually worked. Number 18. Ford is played by J.K. Simmons. In case you're not aware, he got a fair amount of attention this year for winning this little thing called an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in Whiplash. Good thing Dipper and Mabel aren't looking for a jazz teacher. Number 19. Some characters, such as Dipper, Mabel, and Candy, only have four fingers, whereas others, like Grunkle Stan, Seuss, Grenda, and Wendy, have five. Number 20. Among the new writers of season two is Josh Weinstein, who is perhaps most famous for being the showrunner on The Simpsons for the last two classic era seasons. Number 21. At the age of 15, Hirsch appeared on David Letterman doing bird calls. Number 22. On Mabel's good deeds list, you can see her feats included sponsoring a clown, taking out the trash, and abolishing the electoral college. Number 23. Gravity Falls got political in the episode The Stanchurian Candidate. There was the Amera Freedoms and Eagle Kissing. And the one-off campaign cry of Yes We Stand is an obvious homage to Obama's iconic 2010 campaign. Number 24. Ford implies he used the mind control tie in the 80s to control Ronald Reagan. Number 25. Some of Ford's crimes include snack evasion, pickpocketing, woodpecker baiting, impersonating a dentist, general indecency, golf cart theft, bingo fraud, telling jokes that go on and on, and pug trap. Trafficking. Number 26. Jason Ritter, the voice of Dipper, played Jeb Bush in a 2008 biopic about George W. Bush. Number 27. Ritter is often kept in the dark about the show's secrets. Early on, Hirsch realized that Ritter was a bit of a blabbermouth and has since deliberately kept him out of the loop about true happenings in Gravity Falls. Number 28. If Mabel's voice sounds familiar to you, there could be any number of reasons for that. Kirsten Shaw is also Louise Belcher on Bob's Burgers, Sarah Lynn on BoJack Horseman, and Jake Jr. on Adventure Time, to name a few. Number 29. Kirsten Shaw isn't the only borrowed voice from Adventure Time. Nikki Yang, who voices BMO, does the voice for Candy Chu. And John DiMaggio, who plays Jake, does the voice of Manly Dan. Number 30. Unsurprisingly, Hirsch has been obsessed with codes and conspiracies since he was a child. He says he recorded TV commercials on Windows 9 and would reverse them to see if he was being subliminally influenced to watch Pokemon by Japanese spies. Number 31. Upon Mayor Bafumlefumet's death, we learn that he was raised by bears and may have started World War I. Number 32. You will never ever see an alien on Gravity Falls. Even though a UFO has appeared in the series, Hirsch has a distaste for showing actual aliens. Number 33. Ironically enough, aliens abound on a show in the Gravity Falls universe. Hirsch recently commented that the series exists in the same universe as Adult Swim's Rick and Morty. Number 34. For the eagle-eyed viewer in the Rick and Morty episode Close Encounters of the Rick Kind, a Mystery Shack mug comes flying out of the portal. Number 35. You can also see a visual of Bill Cipher on a computer screen in the couple's therapy clinic in the episode Big Trouble in Little Sanchez. Number 36. Hirsch and Roiland have also given each other cameos on their respective shows. Hirsch plays Toby Matthews on the episode Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, and Roiland has a recurring role in Gravity Falls as Blendon Blandon. Number 37. Another phenomenon you will never see on Gravity Falls is a wish-based story. Hirsch dismisses it as, quote, a kid's show cliche. Number 38. If you thought the discount auto warrior were an homage to Mad Max, you're absolutely right. Number 39. One episode of Gravity Falls takes over a year to produce. Six months for boards, two months for animatics, six months for animation, and two months for retakes. And that doesn't even include writing the episodes. Number 40. Because Gravity Falls is a script-driven show, most of the writing is done by the writers, as opposed to the show like Adventure Time, which is storyboard-driven. Number 41. The writer's room has two sides of cards on the wall, one with potential character conflicts, crises, life issues, etc., and other with potential monsters in Magic Fair. The writing process largely involves mixing and matching these two kinds of problems and figuring out which can thematically complement each other. Number 42. Creating the backgrounds on Gravity Falls is a three-step process. First, a rough sketch is sent in for approval, then the backgrounds are inked in by hand. Finally, they're sent off to the painters. So basically, everything about the show is really, really intricate. Hey everyone, we're taking a quick break from Gravity Falls Facts to let you know that we also have a movies and TV channel now. It's called Cinematica, and this month is Star Wars month, so if you're a big fan of movies and TV or Star Wars, you should totally check it out. And with that, back to the facts. Number 43. Despite the numerous references to David Lynch's Twin Peaks throughout the series, Hirsch did not actually see Twin Peaks until he had already sold Gravity Falls. A much more direct influence on Gravity Falls was the short-lived 90s kids show Eerie Indiana. Hirsch has said that it's, quote, unambiguously a ripoff. 
Number 44. Artist Bridget Barriger, who went to Cal Arts with Hirsch, was asked to do the very first character studies for Gravity Falls. Quote, Dipper is based on Alex as a kid, and he should also have a hat. Mabel wears hideous sweaters and is Alex's foil. Hirsch's only note for Wendy was, maybe she's tall? I don't know. Number 45. Joe Pitt, who also worked on character design for the show, shared another early sketch of Dipper looking especially scrawny and scratchier looking pine. Number 46. The costume worn by Dipper in The Inconvenience Scene came from the childhood of one of the writers. Apparently, when his parents would leave, his sister would make him wear a lamb costume and prance around. Number 47. Bill Cipher is Hirsch's favorite character. Apparently, the character was created early on in the development of the show. Number 48. When Hirsch was thinking about the design for Bill Cipher, it struck him as hilarious to take the most ominous Illuminati-looking symbol and slap Mr. Peanut arms and legs on him and throw him into the mix. Number 49. Stan's first foray in the conman ship with Sham Total and his memorable tagline of, it's a total sham, is an obvious parody of Sham Wow, which is not as blatant about its fraud and admittedly did not work by smearing everything with paint. Number 50. Gravity Falls is in roadkill country. Number 51. Hirsch has stated that giving Dipper and Mabel's parents on-screen personas would, quote, rob the show of its entire being. Number 52. Robbie Valentine's band is Robbie V and the Tombstones. We've seen some posters of Robbie wearing eye makeup and peeking from a tombstone with the text, you're dead, which looks promising. Number 53. The episode Blendon's Game was originally going to end with Dipper and Mabel using their time wish to bring Seuss's son from the future to meet Seuss and assure him he's going to be an amazing father. Number 54. Shmabullock's family has a continuous presence in Gravity Falls. Shmabullock Sr. is studied by Ford when he first arrives in Gravity Falls. Number 55. Hirsch only played Dungeons & Dragons once with Pendleton Ward from Adventure Time and Pat McHale over the Garden Wall. That didn't stop him from having an entire episode based around a game called Dungeons, Dungeons & More Dungeons. Number 56. Hirsch built a bar in the Disney television offices. He calls the bar Grunkle Stan's Bar. Number 57. One of the fast food establishments in Gravity Falls is Yumberjacks, where Seuss can be seen ordering a kid's meal. Number 58. The voice of the wizard Probabilitor was none other than Weird Al Yankovic, a childhood hero of Hirsch's, which of course prompted Hirsch to ask Weird Al to help create this red Ridiculous fine. Number 59. After all that debate amongst fans, it turns out that Stan's tattoo is a burn he incurred during his fight with Ford immediately before his brother's disappearance. Number 60. The supervising producer for Gravity Falls is Rob Renzetti, who is also the creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot. Number 61. Candy is fluent in Korean, which makes sense since Nikki Yang also voices Lady Rainicorn in Adventure Time, a character that literally only speaks in Korean. Number 62. One of the primary directors of season one, Aaron Springer, was also also a writer and storyboard artist on SpongeBob SquarePants during its first 10 years. And any SpongeBob fan will tell you that those early years were the best years. Number 63. Seuss has admitted that he writes fan fiction about Stan. Number 64. Hirsch's first love was The Simpsons. So here we are, doing a second 107 Facts installment. No other show has a second 107 Facts installment? That's right. The Simpsons. Number 65. In the pilot, Grunkle Stan's invitation to have Dipper and Mabel choose any item from the gift shop exists solely as a trick for the audience to get to know the characters. Number 66. There's a cut extended fight scene from Double Dipper in which Dipper and Tyrone fight each other with toilet bowl cleaners and throw magazines at each other. Number 67. Dipper's mysterious novel series of choice is The Sibling Brothers. You can see him reading their novel, The Telltale Fable of the Unstable Table, before he goes to sleep. Number 68. In lieu of the twin e ESP, Dipper and Mabel's allergies act up around the same time. Number 69. The voice actor for Olmec from Legends of the Hidden Temple voices Waddles the Pig. Number 70. Linda Cardellini, the voice of Wendy, hasn't only solved mysteries in the cartoon realm, she also played Velma in the live-action Scooby-Doo movie from 2002. Number 71. Tyler, the cute biker, is now mayor of Gravity Falls, purely because he's the only one who filled out the paperwork. Number 72. Stan's tourist attraction enemies are Granny Sweetkin's Yarn Ball, Upside Down Town, Log Land, Corn Maze, and Mystery Mountain. Number 73. Mystery Mountain is a parody of the Trees of Mystery, which is located within Redwood State Park in California. Like Mystery Mountain, the Trees of Mystery boast a museum and their very own gigantic Paul Bunyan statue. Number 74. Magic has to be in every episode. After the airing of the second episode, fans reacted very negatively to there being no sense of magic in the episode. Number 75. 
Early on in production, Hirsch was informed of another long mid-season hiatus separating the season into two parts. Because of this foresight, the writers decided to write and treat the two groups of episodes as their own seasons. This led to the idea of ending on a cliffhanger with the reveal of Grunkle Stan's brother. Number 76. To absolutely no one's surprise, Grenda is voiced by a man, but that man, Carl Farulo, is also a storyboard artist on shows such as Phineas Ferb and Sanjay and Craig. Number 77. Lazy Susan got her lazy eye during the very first tour Stan gave of the soon-to-be Mystery Shack. Number 78. Susan's voice is none other than Jennifer Coolidge. Number 79. The first character Alex Hirsch ever drew was Super Paper Bag Man. Hirsch was in the second grade, so he still had a ways to go. Number 80. Hirsch's main advice to aspiring writers and showrunners is to focus on the characters and to write what you know from your life experiences. Number 81. The temporal landscape of the show is intended to mirror summer camp. Childhood is finite, Hirsch says. That's why time moves forward, and unfortunately, the show can't have seemingly endless Simpsons-like run. Number 82. When Hirsch pitched the show to Disney, the thing he said he was the most excited about was the opportunity to make fun of his sister for 20 episodes a year. Number 83. Gravity Falls is the Disney Channel's first animated 22-minute serialized comedy. Number 84. Legally, Disney is not allowed to include any references to real-life people, products, politics, or religions unless granted permission otherwise. An example of this was in the episode Headhunters. Larry Keane granted permission for the use of his likeness and name. Number 85. Hirsch admits his sensibilities quote, lean towards straight comedy and says he's used the magic realism and emotional sincerity present in Gravity Falls to round out the content. Number 86. Ford has 12 PhDs. Number 87. Granda has a boyfriend, Marius von Funshauser, an Austrian baron she met through the Northwest. Number 88. Marius's voice is provided by Matt Chapman because nothing says dashing baron like strong bad. Number 89. Since Summerween was built around the concept that the audience itself was going into the mystery shack and getting locked up by Grunkle Stan, the original idea for the tag was for the audience to turn out to be M. Night Shyamalan the entire time. But alas, M. Night Shyamalan would not let them use his name or likeness. Number 90. When Pacifica Northwest is arguing with her parents in the episode Golf War, Disney insisted that all characters wear seatbelts. Number 91. Hirsch really wants to do an episode where Grunkle Stan creates a cult and, quote, mocks Scientology into the ground. Hirsch says that Stan is absolutely an L. Ron Hubbard type personality. Number 92. With question by fans about how he deals with censorship in children's cartoons, he compared the experience to a chimp constantly beating you with a wiffle ball bat. Number 93. Other than a few computer-generated vehicles, Gravity Falls is entirely hand-drawn, like in the days of yore. Number 94. One common device in Gravity Falls is to, quote, take relationships that should be fraught with annoyance and put a little love in there. For example, instead of the stereotypical situation of cops being hard on the rookie, Hirsch thought it would be funnier if the sheriff would be overjoyed every time his employee was inept and give him candy. Number 95. Famous Gravity Falls fans include R.L. Stein, Bruce Springsteen, and Jon Stewart. Number 96. The horrifying, sweaty, one-armed monstrosity is voiced by none other than comedian Louis C.K. Number 97. While Stan remains grunkle, Dipper and Mabel always go the extra mile and refer to Ford as Great Uncle. Number 98. Bill's hench maniacs are called 8-Ball, Cryptos, Teeth, Keyhole, Hectorgon, Amorphous, Veronica, Pacifier, the being whose name must never be said, otherwise known as Xanthar, and whatever those weird eyeball bats are called. Number 99. After the last episode, Weird Mageddon Part 1, it doesn't look like Gravity Falls exists anymore, so the show switched up the opening title sequence. The original sequence now collapses upon itself, and we get the Weird Mageddon edition with Bill and his cronies supplementing the protagonist. Number 100. If you play at the end of the credits in reverse, you'll hear Bill saying, I'm watching you. I'm watching you. Number 101. Killing people isn't weird enough for Bill. Instead, he prefers cruel and unusual punishments, such as switching the orifices in your face, or like Ford, turning you into stone. Number 102. Discarded names for Weird Mageddon include Odd Pocalypse and Bizarre Mageddon. Weird Mageddon won because of its silly clumsiness. Number 103. The visuals of Weird Mageddon were, in Hirsch's words, everyone's imagination just uploaded into this pocket of an episode. Number 104. Before beginning production on Gravity Falls, Alex was asked by Disney to help develop the show Fish Hooks. He even directed the pilot. Number 105. Hirsch is also known from the get-go that Bill would cause an apocalyptic scenario. Number 106. Alex Hirsch stated at New York Comic Con that he would be releasing a 288-page volume of the journals. He guaranteed many mysteries about the history of Gravity Falls and even some unsolved mysteries of Bill would indeed be revealed. And number 107. While we're at it, Hirsch has always plotted out the 
beginning, middle, and end of the show. For instance, they've already solved the origin of the magic in the town. Even 214 facts doesn't seem like quite enough. Thankfully, we've got a third video with another 107. It's 107 Gravity Falls Facts You Should Know Part 3. I know, we got really creative with that title. You can thank us later. What do unicorn sweaters, a quantum destabilizer, and sock operas have in common? Absolutely nothing. Unless you're in Gravity Falls, of course. Hi, I'm Alyssa with Channel Frederator, and we're here to check out even more facts. This is 107 more, more facts about Gravity Falls. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. <laughs> After three years, two seasons, and 40 episodes, Gravity Falls came to an end on February 15th, 2016. Mabel and Dipper ended their crazy and memorable summer at the Mystery Shack, just in time to celebrate their 13th birthdays. The last episode of the series was written back in 2015, about a year before the finale aired. Since animation is such a slow process, creator Alex Hirsch had time to deal with the show ending, as he knew there would not be a third season. In fact, Hirsch originally didn't want to make any more episodes after the first season. He had written every episode of season one before the first episode had even aired, and was concerned that people wouldn't like the show. Luckily, Hirsch's friends Pat McHale, creator of Over the Garden Wall, and Jon Stewart encouraged him to continue the show for a second season. He couldn't have left season one on such a cliffhanger. For a long time, Hirsch wasn't even allowed to let anyone know that Gravity Falls was only going to be two seasons. Hirsch put together a live-action alternate reality game called Cypher Hunt, which ran from July 20th through August 2nd of 2016. The goal of Cypher Hunt was to find a statue of Bill Cypher by finding and decoding clues hidden all over the world. The first players to the statue would receive a prize, but Hirsch argued that the hunt was more about the journey than the destination. Some of the locations players visit along the way are the Kazan Cathedral in St. Petersburg, Russia, and Griffith Park in Los Angeles. The first few locations of the hunt made the shape of Dipper's birthmark, the Big Dipper, when connected together. For one prize during the hunt, fans could decipher a username and password that allowed them to sign on to a secret website and view the unaired original pilot for Gravity Falls. The unaired pilot followed much of the same plot of Tourist Trap, but with altered dialogue and wildly different character and art design. It's an interesting look into what the show could have been. Hirsch created the pilot in 2010, right after he graduated from Cal Arts, by drawing most of the storyboard on post-it notes. Disney then rush ordered the pilot from the studio, where he was working at the time, a low-budget flash animation joint in Canada. This pilot was only 12 minutes, half of what a regular Gravity Falls episode would be. This led to Wendy and Seuss not making the final cut, or the mysterious Journal 3. Instead, Dipper reads, Dr. Crackpock's Book of the Dead, which, to be fair, sounds like a pretty wild book. In Taurus Trap, Dipper picks out his iconic blue pine tree hat, but this pilot shows Dipper wearing his hat throughout the episode. Hirsch has spoken many times about the autobiographical nature of the show, but cites the biggest inspiration as the dynamic between him and his twin sister, Ariel. Every summer, they were forced to visit the relatives out in the middle of nowhere, with no internet, TV, or fun around for miles. This encouraged them to use their imaginations to fill the void, and created a strong sibling bond. For the Monster of the Week format, Hirsch drew on his childhood obsession with the X-Files. For him, the show serves as a sort of wish fulfillment, with each episode presenting the characters with new adventures that Hirsch wished he could have had when he was younger. Hirsch was adamant in the writer's room that Mabel was not dumb. She just likes to mess with people and have fun, and she isn't worried about what others think of her. Hirsch did say Mabel's storylines were more difficult to write, as their source of conflict comes from the clash between her fantasy world and the real world. The character has to learn that she won't always get what she wants and she has to balance her expectations with reality. Hirsch hit some pretty deep and resonant notes in Gravity Falls, and it makes sense that he did initially plan to write kids' animation. He started his work on the kids' series only after Disney approached him to pitch what would become Gravity Falls. The Simpsons were a huge comedic influence for Hirsch growing up, and showed him that animation could be as funny and smart as live-action television. Hirsch considered season one of the show to be an experiment, and wrote most of the serialized story action into the background to keep the central plot episodic. Season two picked up on the groundwork lead in the first season, and came out with a more grounded and serialized arc. Hirsch usually watched fans' reactions as new episodes would air, but during the series finale, he took a nap. When he woke up, he checked Twitter and was pleased with the overwhelmingly positive responses. A Real Life Journal 3 was released July 26, 2016, written by Alex Hirsch and supervising producer slash story editor Rob Renzetti. The Real Life Journal 3 contains notes from Dipper and Mabel, as well as new pages filled with monsters and secrets never seen on the show. There's even a special edition of the journal that shows extra content to be viewed on the pages with a black light. Twin Peaks received one last shout out in the series finale when Kyle McLaughlin voiced the bus driver that takes Mabel and Dipper home. Hirsch always wanted to have McLaughlin on the show, but could never find the right part. So when the end was near, Hirsch sent the actor a letter explaining how Dipper and Mabel are in many ways children of Twin Peaks, and that it would make sense for Agent Cooper to be the one that takes them home. Though it was never said on the show, Gravity Falls Journal 3 revealed that Dipper's real name is Mason. According to the official Journal 3, at the end of the summer, Journals 1 through 3 were tossed into the bottomless pit, which may or may not be a wormhole, but who knows if that's really the end of them. Stan and Ford have a younger brother named Shermie. Shermie Pine 
Lines as Mabel and Dipper's parental grandfather. Hirsch confirmed that millions of years ago, the entire bowl-shaped valley of Gravity Falls was formed when a UFO crashed into the cliffs around the town and landed. So the townspeople have bumped into little pieces of the UFO over time. It's one of the many reasons why the town is such an unusual place. In season one, Hirsch originally outlined an episode that parodied the film Labyrinth, starring the late David Bowie. In the episode, the twins rent Labyrinth. Dipper keeps making fun of the movie, so Mabel asks the King of the Groblins to take him away. There's also a subplot where it's revealed Dipper only hates the movie because he's scared of puppets. Sadly, the Disney execs thought young kids wouldn't get the references. Interestingly enough, in sock opera, Dipper has no problem with the sock puppets. Maybe he got over his fear? In Weird Mageddon 1, there's a scene where Dipper and Wendy are driving through weirdness bubbles. They briefly become live-action versions of themselves, played by their real-life voice actor counterparts Jason Ritter and Linda Cardellini. In the series finale, Bill was originally going to sing a song about everything he'd do when he exits the rift. Hearst said that they started writing the musical number, but cut it when they realized there wasn't enough time. The Zodiac shown and hinted at throughout the series was revealed in Weird Mageddon 3 Take Back the Falls to be a mystical human energy circuit that can generate a force strong enough to defeat Bill. Each character represents a symbol on the Zodiac in Weird Mageddon 3. Dipper is a pine tree due to his hat. Mabel is a shooting star because of her sweaters. Gideon is the pentacle because he has the symbol on his cape and the tended telepathy. Zeus is the question mark because of his shirt. Ford is a six-fingered hand because of his polydactylism. Robbie is the stitched heart due to his hoodie, which he's had since the seventh grade. Pacifica is the llama, seen on the sweater she borrows from Mabel. And Stan is the fish-like symbol because of his fez. Some of the symbols are more metaphorical, like the spectacles representing the scholarly old man McGucket. And Wendy is ice because she's cool and calm in the face of danger. Ford and Stan finally get to fulfill their childhood dream of sailing around the world mentioned in A Tale of Two Stands. An early sketch of Mabel included headgear, but Hearst decided against it, thinking it would obscure her face too much. Mabel's favorite anime movie is The Cranky Girl Who Did Chores in Spirit Town, and she's seen it over 82 times. Almost as many times as I've seen Spirited Away. Gideon was partially inspired by a child psychic Hirsch's mother saw on TV. Hirsch felt like he would be a suitable and entertaining rival for Stan. Mabel, Dipper, and Stan have all been in the county jail thanks to one of Stan's family fun days, but only Stan has been to jail in Columbia. If Stan wants to travel anywhere, he's limited to cars, boats, and trains. He was banned from airplanes after petitioning to get July 13th banned from the calendar. Hirsch had said he pictures Pacifica getting a job at Greasy's Diner and working with Lazy Susan after her family loses Northwest Manor. Zeus's favorite anime is Neon Crisis Revelations Angry Cute Girl Annihilation. It's a good pick, but I wonder if he prefers the dubbed version. Journal 2 contains information on how to summon Bill Cipher, while Journal 3 has instructions on how to stop Bill if he is summoned. Smart thinking, Ford. Bill's original concept art had him as green instead of his iconic yellow. He was eventually switched to the latter after his green body looked too much like a leaf. Bill is, like, really, really old. He claims to be older than time or the universe, which would make him about 13.8 billion cosmological years old. He doesn't look a day over 30 to me! It's revealed that Bill is actually from the second dimension. This might be a reference to the fact that Gravity Falls itself is a 2D animated show. What do ancient Egyptians, George Washington, and Stanley Kubrick have in common? They've all been enlisted by Bill to build this portal. It was confirmed by Hirsch during a charity drawathon that Deputy Durland and Sheriff Blubbs are a couple. The Mystery Shack was originally the home of Ford Pines, and he lived there during his studies of Gravity Falls. It was only after his brother had disappeared that Stan moved into the shack and turned it into the Mystery Shack in order to pay Ford's rent. But before it was the Mystery Shack, the ramshackle house was called the Murder Hut when it first opened. Sheesh, Stan, glad you lightened up. Have you ever wondered what happened to Giffany? Or is it Giffany? Either way, don't worry, she's not dead. Hirsch confirmed at Big Fest 2016 in the Gravity Falls Journal 3 that she's still alive, somewhere. Manly Dan was called Boyish Dan when he was a boy, so I wonder if that means he'll be called Old Man Dan when he's old. Wendy's father makes her and her brothers train for the apocalypse during Christmas. You gotta be prepared, even during the most wonderful time of the year. Mabel and Dipper make fake IDs so they can get into the bar downtown in the episode Headhunters. Their fake names are Sir Dipping Sauce and Lady Mapleton, aged 45 and 21. In The Inconveniencing, Mabel's dolphin hallucination, Aoshima, was named after Gravity Falls director John Aoshima. Onward, Aoshima! Dipper's clones number three and number four disappear after they ride off with Robbie's bicycle at the end of Double Dipper. They get one last appearance in the end credits of Weird Mageddon 3 Take Back the Falls. Mabel is able to wear nachos as earrings with the help of some very sticky nacho cheese. I'm jealous. In Irrational Treasure, Mabel and Dipper discover that the Northwest cover-up document also states that Thomas Jefferson was actually just two kids in an overcoat standing on each other's shoulders, and an enormous evil time-devouring baby from another dimension is frozen in an Antarctic glacier. And I bet that's just the tip of the iceberg. The pixel sprites in Fight Fighters were animated by Paul Robertson, who is known for Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, the game, and the feds. In the 
cold open of Summerween, Mabel and Dipper pass a shelf of masks, which are actually the faces of crew who work on the show. Look closely and you'll see John Aoshima, Eric Fountain, and Matt Brawley. When Mabel receives messages and bottles from Romando in the deep end, one of the bottles says the Bem, which is her name backwards. Maybe that's how they spell things under the sea? Before going to fight the bat in the kitchen and dreamscapers, Dipper picks up a spoon and a saucepan, which are both nicknames for the constellation the Big Dipper. And Mabel's sunset sweater in dreamscapers was meant to represent the show's transition from a light to dark series. In sock opera, Seuss and Stan's puppets are both made from paper bags rather than socks. A for effort, Stan. The VHS clash of the genres is rated O for old people. Little Gift Shop of Horrors originally had a twist ending where the visiting tourist was revealed to be M. Night Shyamalan. It's revealed in Blendon's game that Seuss lives on Chambrot Drive, which is a shout out to Hirsch's friend and inspiration for the character, Jesus Chambro. Ford may have more than just the three journals we've seen. In the last Mabel Corn, Ford's dream contains red and blue journals with yellow six-fingered hands on the covers, as well as a brown journal with a yellow triangle on the front. Weird Mageddon Part 1 is the only full-length episode of the series where Mabel does not speak. If the opening theme of Weird Mageddon 1 is reversed, Bill is heard saying, I'm watching you, nerds! Hirsch said that the second half of Season 2 covered the plot that was originally planned for Season 3. Ever wonder if Quentin Tremblay, America's favorite lost president, had more of a backstory? Hirsch wished he had more time to include all of his thoughts and theories about Tremblay's significance with the scope of the show. Stan was married to a woman in Maryland, but she divorced him after being married for only six hours. Hirsch's grandfather, named Stan, also had a wife named Marilyn. According to Bill Cipher, the worst deal he ever made involved baking with a man named Thomas J. Beale. He also mentions that the ominous being on the other side of the mailbox is a real blabbermouth. In Gravity Falls Journal 3, ghosts are rated from eh, not so deadly, to Demonic Vengeance Spectre, which is real bad. The Time Baby can be easily distracted by jingling keys, which Hirsch mentioned in the In Between the Pines special. The Infinity Sided Die was brought back by Ford from another dimension. It's currently locked in the underground laboratory for safekeeping. In the series finale, Stan Pines retires and gives ownership of the Mystery Shack to Seuss. Hirsch has said his dream would have been to make a Gravity Falls feature film, and at one point Disney discussed it with him. In the end, they decided the show wasn't big enough to warrant it. But Hirsch said if someone would give him $50 million, he make a Gravity Falls movie. Come on guys, let's get that Kickstarter going! Gravity Falls was nominated for Choice TV Animated Show at the Teen's Choice Awards every year from 2013 to 2016. Gravity Falls was nominated for an Emmy in 2014 and 2015 for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Animation. Ian Worrell won for Dreamscapers, and Alonzo Ramirez Ramos won for Not What He Seems. Hirsch had said that he remains open to continuing the series with additional episodes or a special, since there are a couple more characters and plots he'd like to revisit someday. While Gravity Falls is yet to release full seasons on DVD, there are two featurette DVDs that contain episodes from the first season. In February 2016, Disney XD released Take Back the Falls, a game episode available on the Watch Disney XD mobile app. In the game, the user could either be Mabel or Dipper and play through the events of Weird Mageddon 3 Take Back the Falls. The message at the end of the theme song in the series finale read backwards says, Goodbye, Gravity Falls. The series of Gravity Falls takes place from June to September 1st, 2012. Now that is one long summer. All right, we've done our History 101 with that timeline, and we hit up 102 and 103 with all the facts. Now we're going to relive some of the greatest Gravity Falls moments in the way that they were meant to be experienced through the episodes. Although, let's be honest, most folks probably spent about as much time, if not more, with the online fandom than actually watching the show. Which is a good thing, but we've still got this list of the best eight Gravity Falls episodes for ya. When viewers were first introduced to Dipper Mabel and the Mystery Shack back in 2012, they had no idea they were about to embark on one of the craziest, most engaging mystery stories ever committed to television. Over the course of its run, Gravity Falls proved to be a titan of genre storytelling, transcending the animated format and standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with fan favorites like the X-Files and Twin Peaks. From dream demons to fraudulent psychics and beyond, the unraveling of the mystery of the journals and Dipper and Mabel's commitment to uncover the truth captured the hearts and minds of audiences young and old. With so much quality material to dissect and appreciate, ardent fans of Gravity Falls have strong opinions over what episodes are the series' definitive best. While we don't presume to speak for everyone, we here at Frederator are big fans of Gravity Falls ourselves, so we wanted to take the time today to tell you what we think are some of the best episodes of Gravity Falls ever. Hopefully you'll agree. So without further ado, my name is Tim and today on Channel Frederator, we're counting down our top eight Gravity Falls episodes. Let's get started. First, an honorable mention to all of the Gravity Falls shorts. Okay, this one's a bit of a cheat since it's not a main episode or part of the main storyline, but we really, really dig the Gravity Falls shorts that were released on Disney XD while the show was on the air. And if I'm being honest, we included the shorts as a package deal, mostly so we could talk about fixing it with Seuss, which is both my personal favorite of the Gravity Falls short sketches and my favorite renovation show. Fixing it with Seuss 
hits close to home. It captures the unbridled joy of a passionate person with a limited knowledge of editing trying to share their gift to the world. I can't help but smile every time I see green screen errors around Seuss's head. Really, we just love Seuss, and we're not alone. In Mabel's Guide to Dating, Seuss ranks a 12 on the dateability scale. The dateability scale is a scale from 1 to 5. Seuss is the perfect man. All the other shorts are worth watching as well. They give you more of what you want out of your favorite characters. I just happen to think Seuss gets expanded a little bit by his two shorts. And with that, into real numbers. Number 8, Tourist Trapped. They say that the beginning is a good place to start, and in making a list of the best Gravity Falls episodes, we absolutely agree. The show's pilot episode, titled Tourist Trapped, does everything a pilot ought to do. We meet the main characters and are introduced to the central mystery and establish the fact that Gravity Falls is one quirky town. For this reason alone, the episode is essential viewing for fans. However, not a show that settles for good enough, the episode ups the ante by showcasing the series' potential for wacky weirdness right off the bat. When Mabel decides she's on the hunt for an epic summer romance, she meets Norman, who's eventually outed as a stack of gnomes in disguise. There are funnier episodes and episodes with more intense drama and character-filled moments, but this sets the stage so well and gave us some of our favorite Gravity Falls moments, including gnomes vomiting rainbows and the ever-useful grappling hook. Number 7. Fight Fighters Who hasn't wished their favorite video game was real? Well, in the episode Fight Fighters, that's exactly what happens. And just like any careful what you wish for a cautionary tale, Dipper learns way too late that there's not a reset button on reality. When Robbie challenges Dipper to a fight over a broken phone, Dipper inadvertently summons and then recruits game character Rumble McSkirmish as a bodyguard. However, the 16-bit hero is not to be tamed, and despite Dipper's urging otherwise, becomes a threat to all who stand in his way. If you like video games, and we know most of you do, this episode is a playground of references and winks to the gaming community, and it's a great slice of nostalgia for anyone used to spending way too long mashing buttons. And no, it's not the kind of references where a show just says video games and expects you to applaud. Notably, the original Donkey Kong and Street Fighter get shoutouts. I laughed way too hard at- Oh, my car. Oh, and for the pixel art, they recruited legendary Paul Robertson, pixel artist extraordinaire, and would bring him back for Seuss and the Real Girl. We like video games and we like seeing them acknowledge as legitimate sources of pop culture, and the craftsmanship and love in this episode take it over the top. Number 6, Double Dipper slash Scaryoke. As any tried and true Rocky Horror fan could tell you, every adventure into weirdness is better with a musical number. Gravity Falls doesn't shy away from that notion, and in particular, Mabel is always ready to bring on the tunes. In Double Dipper, Mabel stands up for the less popular kids, unleashing her vocal talents in the form of the suspiciously Journey-esque rock ballad Don't Stop Unbelieving catapulted the episode into the territory of instant fame. Favorite. And it's not the only instance of fun karaoke numbers. The other Pines family members aren't so keen on karaoke, but in the season 2 opener, Scaryoke, they put aside their reservations when it's the only way to keep a zombie horde from overrunning the shack. It's a rocking and welcome return to the series' second season, and the song Stan Dipper and Mabel perform, Taking Over Midnight, is darn catchy. Wouldn't it be great if more forces of evil could be defeated with a killer tune? Anytime Mabel takes to the mic, it's an automatic favorite from us. Also, at the end of Scaryoke, Stan reveals something we've all been wondering about. How can he not see all the paranormal stuff going on? Well, he does. It's obvious after all. I love this. Most shows that gear younger don't worry about things like this, and Gravity Falls addresses it head on. Number 5, A Tale of Two Stands. Another cornerstone episode of the show, A Tale of Two Stands is the game-changing episode where we learn the secrets of Grunkle Stan and his past. Although earlier in the series Stan denied any knowledge of the supernatural, we learn that he and his twin brother Ford are connected to the core mystery of the show. In their own investigation into the world of weird led to Ford's disappearance years prior. Lending depth to a character who was utilized to comedic effect, the episode also reveals the level of compassion and caring Stan has for his family, something he attempts to deny. When Ford returns, Stan makes an impassioned plea not to involve Dipper and Mabel in the mystery, proving that he cares and he doesn't want the duo hurt. I've heard from some people that they don't like the change in this show's dynamic from this point out, since Dipper hangs out with Ford and Mabel gets cut out. While I think there's some truth to it, I think this episode answers the right questions and asks interesting new ones. Number 4, Dipper vs. Manliness In a world of monsters and ghouls, there's still nothing stranger than growing up. In the episode Dipper vs. Manliness, Dipper tackles this problem when he decides that he's ready to become a man. Heading into the woods, he encounters the Manitar, mythical creatures that embody masculine stereotypes. After running a battery of tests to prove his masculinity, Dipper learns that testosterone-driven feats aren't as important as being a good person. This episode reminded us that it's okay to be who you are, and there's nothing wrong with growing up and growing as a person in your own time and way. I also like that for all his teasing at the start of the episode, Grunkle Stan sides with Dipper on this one. He's proud that Dipper stands up for himself, even without hair on his chest or a deep 
voice. Number three, Sock Opera. A great scholar once said, everything is better with puppets. And who could disagree? In the episode Sock Opera, Mabel attempts to stage a sock puppet rock opera to impress a local puppeteer. But when Dipper's body is possessed by Bill Cipher, things go awry, as they tend to do when demonic possession is involved. With the battle for Dipper's body unfolding before a live audience, the episode is at once a grave conflict between the cosmic forces of good and evil and a hilarious romp with sock puppets. The juxtaposition between silly and scary is the very essence of what Gravity Falls is all about, and we couldn't find a better episode to showcase it in than one with sock puppets. Mabel has a number of episodes about boys, but this particular play at romance has the most thought and effort put into it, and it shines. Also, if this were an actual award distributed out, I would nominate Sock Opera for Best Use of Ave Maria by a Cartoon. Number 2. Dreamscapers. The first episode of season one's two-part finale, Dreamscapers is Gravity Falls at its finest. Serving as the introduction of series antagonist Bill Cipher, the episode is a key moment in the show's history, revealing just how far-reaching the central mystery and threat goes. Up to this point in the show's narrative, the biggest bad Dipper and Mabel faced was pint-sized psychic Lil Gideon. But with the arrival of Bill, the Pines learned that their minuscule foe was an appetizer for the challenges that would await them in the coming season. Bill raises the stakes within seconds of his appearance. I still wonder what bribe convinced standards and practices that the whole deer teeth thing was okay. That said, the episode doesn't just torment you for 20 minutes. With most of the episode occurring in the dream world, comedic relief happens without the need for explanation. Also, this episode gave us the most 80s dream boys in all of existence, Xyler and Kraz. And finally, number one, the inconveniencing. Dipper, Mabel, Wendy, and the town's teens all hang out in a spooky convenience store. Unfortunately, their teen angst and texting rouse angry spirits of the store's owners. That's how they died after all. Their hearts couldn't take the hip-hop music. The only thing that saves the gang is Dipper admitting that he's only 12 and doing the ever-cute Lammy Lammy dance. This episode encompasses everything Gravity Falls is about. It's funny. It's dark. Dipper deals with insecurity. Mabel learns to control impulses, probably. It's all there. Oh, and it teaches you to look for hidden clues by throwing in ones that are more obvious jokes. Since Dipper spends time looking for proof of ghosts, your eyes are scanning the background as well. And since you're looking, you're primed to see the cereal box maze. If you follow all the maze paths, you'll realize there there is no escape from the maze. Here it's a gag, but seeing one gag encourages you to look for more, and then you're seeing Bill Cipher in the background, and then you can't unsee Bill Cipher in the background. In one stroke, you're hunting for the mystery of Gravity Falls. For being such a fantastic representation of the whole series and helping you look at the show closer, the inconveniencing takes top billing. Every list begets another, and who am I to alter fate? Gravity Falls is well known for its mysterious atmosphere, mysterious characters, and mysterious mysteries. It's what kept people coming back week after week, month after month, year after year. You're still here watching Gravity Falls content after all. So why not indulge in a list of the top seven Gravity Falls mysteries? If you can think of any that we missed, we'd love to hear about it down in the comments. Gravity Falls has no shortage of mysteries, both during its run and after it finished. Today, we're going to take a look back at some of the best ones this show had to offer, or how and why they were so good. I'm Jeremy, and these are the top seven best mysteries from Gravity Falls. Number seven, what is with the Northwest family? This one extends quite broadly. Pacifica seemed like a basic bully, but as is quite common with this show, first appearances are often deceiving. She has clearly been indoctrinated by her father to an unhealthy degree, leaving her obsessed with high standards. Her father, Preston Northwest, had the same obsession so it feels like poetic justice that he lost everything to Bill Cipher. Fact is, the Northwests are a long line of liars, grifters, and cheaters, and have become fabulously wealthy by doing so. And as is neatly mirrored by the real world, do everything in their power to keep it that way. Part of this was even lying about the founding of Gravity Falls itself. But the true mystery is the Northwest Mansion. While the part of the ghost haunting the mansion itself was resolved, more mysteries remained. The mystery of the ghost's identity was actually revealed in the Gravity Falls Journal 3, published in 2016. He was actually Archibald Corduroy, yes, ancestor of Wendy. But that still leaves the question of the tapestry. It's most definitely the people bowing down to Bill Cipher to a background of the world in flames. But this raises way more questions than it answers. Why do the Northwests have this tapestry? Did they have prior knowledge of Weird Mageddon and sought to take advantage for themselves? Or was Preston Northwest simply an opportunist trying to make the most of the situation? Bill Cipher is everywhere, yes, 
but this is quite possibly the strangest place for him to show up, and we never get an answer as to why. Then again, that's what makes a mystery a mystery, and it's all the more reason for us to keep talking about it. Number 6. Who is Seuss's father? This is definitely one of the saddest ones. The fact that we never get an answer to this makes it all the more so. If anyone deserved to be happy in this show, it's the ever-upbeat Seuss. Instead, everything we see of Seuss's father points to him being a deadbeat doing everything in his power to never spend time with his family. The fact that Seuss imagined his father to be a Mexican wrestler in the finale makes it even sadder that even though he barely knew the man, he's still desperate for his approval. He doesn't even remember his father's face, and instead pictures it as a face you once saw in a hot sauce bottle. On top of this, Seuss reveals his goal of trying to get adopted by Stan Pines, and would even go so far as to legally change his name to Stan Jr., which only makes his need for a father all the more tragic. It's also impossible to say whether it's for the best or the worst that Seuss never actually gets to see his father again, because compared to a Mexican wrestler who likes playing catch with his son, basically everything would disappoint. Number 5. How did Gideon come by the second journal? This one is fairly self-explanatory because we can only speculate about it. It's revealed at the end of the episode Gideon is introduced in that he has the second journal. We just don't know much more. All we know is that he is obsessed with the power he thinks they can provide, when that actually isn't the case. But even though he wants them, he knows painfully little about them. Logical deduction pointed him to there being at least one other one, but he didn't even know that there was a third journal until he saw it in Dipper's possession. And none of this explains how he got the second one. The only clue we get is from Stanford himself because he said that he hid them. Considering his brilliance, he clearly didn't hide them well enough, as both of them were discovered by children. We know how Dipper found the third one, pretty much by accident, and while Gideon tries explaining the true nature of the journals to his father, his version does seem a bit dramatically embellished, let's say. It could have been a mere coincidence, just like Dipper, but it's also possible that something tipped him off. We will probably never know. Number 4. What do all the symbols mean? There is no shortage of strange symbols showing up all around Gravity Falls. A fairly persistent one is the Bill Cipher Zodiac, which finally gets its explanation in the finale. But there are of course plenty that never get explained at all. There are those on the alien ship Ford Pines discovered, but also those in his journals, plenty of which never get explained at all. Why doesn't he just write in English? Did he teach himself those different alphabets from existing sources? Or did he create them to have a more efficient way of writing down information? He even writes in binary, which while fairly easy to decode, is not an efficient way for a person to write something down. Especially Ford, who has a noted distaste for computers, the main beneficiaries of binary. I decided to call up my old college buddy, Fiddleford McGucket, a young but brilliant mechanic who was wasting his talent trying to make personal computers in some garage in Palo Alto. Even though the show is almost a decade old by now, people are still speculating what everything means, including us right now. Some of the symbols are from some kind of religious origin, others from physics, some from alchemy, and there are even those that are just gibberish. But parsing out exactly which is which could keep a person busy for a long time. Number 3. What is the truth about the journals? This one starts right in the first episode. The fact that Dipper discovers the journal with a three on it of course suggests that there are two more, and it's brilliant how the show takes its time gradually revealing more and more about them. Gideon having the second one, Stan Pines having the first, it only gets you more invested. And of course, the biggest question of them all, who is the author? Where there is a book, there is an author, and the fact that the show withholds this information from us for so long is brave but also the best possible decision. We'll get back to him later on because there are many more mysteries surrounding him, but for now, suffice it to say that the reveal was well worth the wait. And of course, how come they are so complete? And there is one little tidbit that you may not have known about. There is a fourth journal as noticed in Gravity Falls Lost Legends, but since we know nothing about it, it doesn't get mentioned in the show, and not even Ford himself hints that it exists. It's very likely that this is a gag at the expense of the audience, but who knows, Gravity Falls is known for having things be more important than they first appear, so it could very easily be more than that. Number 2. What does Bill Cipher want? Bill Cipher is one of the biggest enigmas the show has to offer. Again, 
Journal 3 does offer some insight into him. It's revealed that he came from something called the Second Dimension, a place that he despised so much that he ended up plunging it into burning chaos. But this left him stuck in the Nightmare Realm, a lawless place with no consistent physics. He was unable to take physical form, yet, but was still incredibly powerful inside the Nightmare Realm. He used his millennia of knowledge to lure Stanford Pines in with promises of wisdom, which is all a lie, of course. But he doesn't actually answer the question of what he wants. He talks about his history, but nothing about that actually relates to the human realm. If nothing else, it appears to be just another place for him to laud his power over, something he can rule and uses his own giant sandbox. After all, that's the thing about Bill Cipher. He's all-powerful, yes, but he's also arrogant, vain, sadistic, and has a constant desire for praise. Nothing would ever satisfy him, and that turns out to be his downfall. But because of that, we never know the exact motivation he had for taking over the world. Was it a quest for power? A desire to build a home of his own? Regain the approval of a lost parent? Or maybe he just enjoys watching the world burn? It's impossible to tell. The one thing that doesn't touch on is how omnipresent Bill Cipher is in Gravity Falls. As mentioned, he's in the Northwest Mansion, but also in the Mystery Shack. The backs of playing cards, the negative $12 bill, on arcade games, on DVD boxes, and as graffiti on fences. In fact, Bill Cipher's reach isn't limited to Gravity Falls. He's been spotted in The Owl House, Amphibia, Star vs. the Forces of Evil, Rick and Morty, DuckTales, and even in The Simpsons. Now, it's perfectly possible all of these are just jokes so that we keep talking about him, making me the butt of this joke, but it's more fun to think of this as Bill's multidimensional reach. Number 1. What is Stan Pines up to? This mystery proves that there is nothing quite like a good build-up, and man does it have a suitable payoff. As early as Episode 1, we see that he is working on something that he doesn't want anyone to know about. But that's not all. He has a mark on his shoulder, later revealed to be an accidental brand. But most of all, the fact that he is never honest about his past until after his goal is accomplished. We know that he's a con artist, great at grifting people out of their money, but at the same time does have a genuine affection for Dipper and Mabel. But of course, the culmination of his story is the episode Not What He Seems, generally held to be the very best episode of Gravity Falls. The moment where Mabel lets go and trusts him has been immortalized everywhere by fans of the show. And the fact that the entire mystery surrounding Stan Pines was all building up to the reveal of the author of the journals themselves, and the author is his long-lost brother, it's definitely something else. Not only that, but the fact that the showrunners had the guts to let this mystery run its course is not something you see very much of anymore these days. The reveal that he had Journal 1 all along hits like a bomb, and the fact that it comes at the end of the first season is such a great cliffhanger. It's almost cruel. I'd go so far as to say that it's basically a more tantalizing aspect of the season 1 finale than the Pine Twins beating Gideon at his own game, but now I'm going a little bit far. And of course, there are the new theories coming out of the Owl House that he was actually married to Ida for a day before she left him again. It's speculation, but it's a fun theory. Going back to Not What He Seems, adding the real Stanford Pines to the mix of characters is brilliant, an amazing counterweight to Stanley's common ways, and someone to complement Dipper's intelligence. It's also clever that they didn't add him to the mix too soon, as having an expert on hand would make things too easy for Dipper to solve everything. Everything here is perfectly balanced, the build-up, the payoff, the amount of hints it drops to keep us invested, and it all comes together to form the best mystery that Gravity Falls has to offer. And that's it! The 7 Best Mysteries that Gravity Falls has to offer. What's your favorite? Or have you solved any of the ones we mentioned here? Here are some more mysteries. These ones are even more mysterious if you can believe it. The Top 10 Gravity Falls Mysteries That May Never Be Solved the world of Gravity Falls is ending, and not because an omniscient master of chaos has claimed the universe as his own. Well, actually, okay, yeah, it is because of that. But also because the one-hour special Weird Weirdmageddon Part 3 marks the end of the series, and hopefully answering some of the big questions remaining about Gravity Falls. However, there's too many loose ends lying around to tie up in a single episode. Whether it's outside the scope of the story or the result of a quirk in the show's production, there are many mysteries that might just be left open-ended forever. But what's a mystery show without some on 
unsolved mysteries anyway. A three-year Q&A? A documentary? NBC's Dateline? My name is Tim, and today on Channel Frederator, we have 10 Gravity Falls mysteries that may never be solved. And in case this wasn't super duper obvious, there are spoilers ahead. Number 10. What's Dipper's first name? We already know that Dipper gets his nickname from his constellation-shaped birthmark, but his original given name has gone unspoken so far. Not even by Mabel. His first name could possibly be dropped in the final episode. Maybe Bill Cipher's gonna taunt him with his omniscience, but it might be more fun left unknown. Show writer Jeffrey Rowe joked on Twitter that Dipper's real name is Lamanique. I would go by Dipper too if that was my real name. Or even better, Tyrone. Number nine, who is that baby? At one point in Stan and Ford's life story in A Tale of Two Stans, we can see that Stan's mother is holding a baby. Both Ford and Stan are great uncles to Dipper and Mabel, so there must be a third sibling who's Dipper and Mabel's grandparent. And Stan introduces the young twins to Ford as Shermie's grandkids. So is the baby the infant father of Mabel and Dipper? If he was, he'd be at the ripe old age of 40 today, given that Stan was around 18 in the flashback. Is a bit young to be a grandparent. Did the Pines family have another surprise after Shermie? Or is that Shermie's baby who needs a little help being raised by Shermie's parents? Number eight, what's with everyone's fingers? Dipper and Mabel's great uncle Ford is iconic for his six-fingered hands. His polydactyly precedes him on the cover of each of his three journals. However, his digit count shouldn't be that out of place considering the finger number varies quite a bit in Gravity Falls. While most of the regular residents have the cartoon classic four-fingered hands, many notable characters are equipped with five, including, but not limited to, Grunkle Stan, Seuss, Gideon, and Old Man McGucket. While perhaps some characters have more fingers to match their larger frame, Wendy's wiry friends Lee and Nate also have five fingers. Could the varying number of fingers be an arbitrary choice by the show's animators or another strange property of Gravity Falls? Also, in case you were wondering, finger number varies between the creatures in Gravity Falls too. For example, the gnomes have four fingers while the manatars have five. Number seven, where did Robbie get his CD? Fans have always suspected Robbie Valentino was more than he appears. After all, his stitch harp does have a space on Bill Cipher's wheel, but attempts to connect him to the supernatural have been somewhat dubious. Sure, he looks a little undead and he has a propensity for death in his band's aesthetic, but what angsty teenager doesn't? Rob's probably no more a zombie than Norman was, although Norman was a set of gnomes. So, what's mysterious though is the CD he used to win Wendy's heart in the episode Boys Crazy back in season one. While Robbie suggests the CD is by some band, the case looks very much like a Necronomicon for a love song and looks like an item Dipper or Gideon might find with the help of Ford's journals. Its origins and how Robbie found it remain unknown to this day. Also, even with a full hour, it's probably not the kind of thing you want to spend a lot of time on. Number six, what's the deal with gold? Everybody's been buying gold for the end times, or at least that's what Stan Pines thinks everyone should be doing, though it's not entirely clear what the gold will be good for. Sure, it's a reliable source of wealth when interest is rocketing up, but if it's the weird Mageddon we're talking about, that money could better be spent on food and supplies. There's different kinds of Doomsday and they need different preps. I've marathoned the show Doomsday Prepper before, so I know all this. Stan's gold scheme might sound like it's from a crackpot conspiracy theorist, except Bill Cipher gives the same advice in the episode Dreamscapers. Could gold somehow be instrumental to survival in the ruins of civilization? But then if it was, why would Bill give any advice? Maybe they've just all been reading Gold Chains for Old Men magazine. Also in Weird Mageddon, Bill turns Ford into metal, so he can probably transmute things into gold. I'm not sure why you would need to buy it earlier. Number five, did the UFO crash cause the weirdness? We finally get an answer to the Floating Cliffs mystery when Dipper and Ford take a day trip to the ancient spacecraft that carved the Gravity Falls Valley millions of years ago. Ford's research has led him to believe that the high number of anomalies in Gravity Falls might be caused by a local structural weakness in reality, allowing the properties of other dimensions to leak in. Is it possible that this dimensional weakness was caused by the UFO? Dedicated fans discovered that the alien engravings inside of the ship mention a probability drive engine, a reference to the infinite improbability drive from Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The infinite improbability device is known for causing weird side effects, such as transforming two thermonuclear missiles into a whale and a sentient potted petunia. So it's not too far off to guess that the alien's probability drive is still operating and causing Gravity Falls' strange happenings. Or was the UFO 
UFO attracted to Gravity Falls' strangeness. The ship crashed millions of years ago, but Bill Cipher's entrance into Gravity Falls was prophesized a billion years ago. Maybe the craft was just another domino in the long chain of events leading up to Weird Mageddon. As Ford said, the answer is yet unknown. Number four, is the shapeshifter an alien? The shapeshifter we meet in Into the Bunker is later hinted to have been hatched by Ford in A Tale of Two Stands. There are many strange creatures that inhabit Gravity Falls, but something about the shapeshifter seems extra alien. The brown writing that Dipper spots inside the downed UFO alludes to the shapeshifter when translated. Specimen has escaped is changing forms. This seems to suggest that the shapeshifter we meet is descended from an escaped alien lab experiment. However, as mentioned before, we don't know if the aliens caused the weirdness or the weirdness caused the aliens. Maybe the spaceship came to Gravity Falls to collect strange and interesting specimens native to Earth, only to end up crashing on the planet. If they were going for strange and interesting animals, they should have gone for the platypus. I mean, yeah, shapeshifter's pretty nuts, but the platypus still looks faked. Number three, who prophesized Weird Mageddon? When Gravity Falls becomes Earth and Sky, fear the beast with just one eye. Fiddleford McGucket echoed those words after a brief dip into another realm of existence, hinting at the rise of the one-eyed demon, Bill Cipher. Who put those words into McGucket's mouth? Most likely Bill himself, as McGucket uttered his name, albeit backwards, before speaking the warning. However, Bill might not be the original author of the prophecy. When Bill breaks the container holding the interdimensional rift and breaks into Gravity Falls, he exclaims, the event one billion years prophesized has finally come to pass. That just begs the question, who wrote the prophecy? It couldn't have been anyone on Earth. One billion years ago is before multicellular life was a thing. Unless one of the time travelers in Time Baby's Force went back in time to warn the world about Bill Cipher, though one billion years before his arrival does seem a little out of the way and would lack an audience. Number two, how is Gravity Falls connected to the world of Rick and Morty? Very astute fans have spotted Stan's mug and notepad that fell into a portal falling out of one of Rick's portal in Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind from Rick and Morty. Were Stan's objects flying out of Rick's portal just a nod to Gravity Falls? After all, Rick and Morty co-creator Justin Rowland is personal friends with Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch, and both shows make allusions to having an infinite number of universes. Could it be that Gravity Falls and Rick and Morty inhabit the same multiverse? Fan artists have already drawn comparisons between the age dimension hopping scientists Ford and Rick, and their respective pubescent counterparts Dipper and Morty. When asked about the possibility of a crossover episode, Alex Hirsch only teased, saying, So far, we've found that these little winking nods between our shows strike the right balance. I can't say whether or not there will be more, but I can say that we like to confuse and amuse people, so who the hell knows? Weirder things have happened, in both shows and in real life. And finally, number one, what does Bill Cipher's wheel mean? Bill Cipher's wheel is probably the most and longest speculated on piece of cryptology in Gravity Falls. It's been there from the very beginning and seems to hold the answers to questions that haven't even been asked yet. Clearly, many of the symbols on the wheel stand for major characters in the show. However, the meaning of some of the other symbols are more ambiguous. For example, fan theories suggest the ice bag could represent Wendy because Dipper fetched her ice in The Time Traveler's Pig, but it could also represent Thompson who gets ice poured down his pants. And now that Ford has made an appearance, it's not clear whether he's supposed to be represented by the glasses or the six-fingered hand. But what does it all mean anyway? There are many, many theories out there, but perhaps the wheel is more of a symbol. While it has an in-universe presence, its formation and symbols have appeared different. In The Stanchurian Candidate, the wheel that Gideon draws has the symbols in a different order than is written in the book. The six-fingered hand has been replaced by the journal, and the crescent shape was updated to match Stan's change of fez. It may be that the details of Bill's wheel are not as universal as investigators might hope. And while it might play a meaningful role in the final episode of Gravity Falls, at this point, it's all just speculation. Now that those mysteries are firmly planted in your mind garden, here's an interdimensional mind gardener. You all know him as Bill Cipher, but I know him as... He's unknowable, he's super powerful, he's a fan favorite for many reasons. So of course we just had to make him the star of his own 107 Facts video. Just don't tell him, I don't know how he'd react. This is 107 Bill Cipher Facts you should know. He is the all-powerful being that hails from the nightmare realm and beyond. All-knowing and yet unknowable. Bill Cipher's very being is incomprehensible to us mortals, but that doesn't mean I won't try. Here are 107 facts about Gravity Falls' public and cosmic enemy number one, Bill Cipher. Number one, just looking at him, Bill Cipher's design is based on the Eye of Providence, that pyramid with the eyeball design you see on the back of dollar bills. Number two, 
Of course, in the universe of Gravity Falls, the Eye of Providence actually comes from him. Need to give credit where credit's due. Number 3. Playing into the whole dollar bill angle, Bill Cipher was originally colored green, not yellow. Number 4. However, one of the artists felt that the first green design made him look too much like a leaf, so they eventually changed his color to yellow. Number 5. Even his name is a reference to money. Bill is like a dollar bill, and Cypher is like a code. Number 6. Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch designed Bill Cypher himself. Number 7. Alex Hirsch is even the one who voices Bill Cypher in the show. Number 8. Hirsch described his voice for Bill as a bad impression of famous director David Lynch. The Gravity Falls crew actually asked Lynch to play Bill, but he declined. Number 9. When Hirsch first created Bill Cypher, the character was just supposed to be a one-off, only to appear in one episode. Over time, Hirsch and the writers changed Bill to be the main antagonist, as he became more and more interwoven within the Gravity Falls lore. Number 10. We know him as truly evil, but Bill wasn't always planned to be so. He was originally written as more of a trickster. Not good or evil, just out to give people headaches. Number 11. Originally, Bill Cipher was named Bill Black. Hirsch thought that the name Black would fit his dark and mysterious personality. Number 12. However, Disney stepped in, worried that they'd be sued by the real-life Bill Black. Number 13. As for the real-life Bill Black, I'm not entirely sure who Disney was specifically worried about. The most famous Bill Black I could find was the bassist in Elvis Presley's original band trio. The dude died in 1965, so maybe Disney was worried about being sued by any and all remaining Bill Blacks. Number 14. Point is, Hirsch and the Gravity Falls team were forced to change Bill's name, so they went with Cypher because they thought that also sounded dark and mysterious. Number 15. Nothing says dark and mysterious quite like the Illuminati. Being based on the Eye of Providence, or vice versa according to the show's lore, Bill Cipher is also a reference to the Illuminati. Number 16. Like the Illuminati, Bill Cipher has had a direct influence over history, again in the world of Gravity Falls. Ancient Egyptians tried to build him a portal, but it only worked for 10 minutes. Number 17. All the portal managed to do was free a jackal-headed man from the Nightmare Realm. We know him better as Anubis, the Egyptian god of the dead. Number 18. Bill Cipher was so angry with the failed portals that he tormented the ancient Egyptians with nightmares as punishment. In response, they built giant stone tributes to Bill, begging him to stop. Number 19. Those tributes are the Great Pyramids. The arms and top hats that they were originally built with have since fallen off. Number 20. Bill Cipher even had an influence on American history. He's the one who gave George Washington inside info on how to beat the British and win the American Revolution. Number 21. Like the ancient Egyptians, Washington's portal for Bill was a bust. He constructed a steam-powered one, but it sank into a swamp. As punishment, Bill also gave Washington horrible nightmares. Number 22. Washington's nightmares were so bad that he ground his teeth to dust and needed wooden replacements. Number 23. To appease Bill Cipher and end his constant nightmares, Washington put him on the $1 bill as the Eye of Providence that we know it to be. Number 24. Even more recently, Bill Cipher helped Stanley Kubrick fake the moon landing in the late 1960s. Number 25. Here was the deal that they'd worked out. Kubrick would get his moon landing and the subsequent career boost. NASA would get to the moon before the Russians in the height of the Cold War, and Bill would get his own portal, courtesy of NASA. Number 26. Well, Kubrick wasn't able to convince NASA to go for the portal. When the bad news hit Bill, he decided to take it out on Kubrick. Number 27. Of course, he gave Kubrick horrible nightmares, but they actually ended up helping him out with his film career. Kubrick would recycle the disturbing imagery in films like A Clockwork Orange and The Shining. Number 28. So why is Bill Cipher so powerful? Well, he's a dream demon, of course, directly from the Nightmare Realm. Number 29. He's not made out of any kind of flesh and bone, but instead pure energy. Number 30. Bill Cipher wasn't originally from the Nightmare Realm, though. Trillions of years ago, he resided in the second dimension, a place of flat minds and a flat world with flat dreams, as Bill puts it. Number 31. This makes Bill older than the universe and even time itself. Number 32. 
They'll manage to escape from the second dimension, but only by immolating the entire dimension and everyone in it, including his own parents. Number 33. As he was traveling between dimensions, Bill ultimately came to control the Nightmare Realm, a dark, undulating, chaotic space between dimensions where chaos reigns. Number 34. With chaos being the name of the game, Bill Cipher came to understand that the Nightmare Realm was doomed to collapse in on itself. Number 35. Luckily for him, Bill also happened upon a prophecy stating that he would merge the Nightmare Realm and the Third Dimension, and so he reached out to humans to accomplish this goal. Number 36. Trouble was, he had no physical form within the Nightmare Realm, so he was forced to reach out to humans through their dreams. He adopted the name Bill Cipher to make it easier to communicate with them. Number 37. No one knows what his original name was from the Second Dimension, or even in the Nightmare Realm, Apparently, if a mortal were to hear Bill's true name, they would evaporate with an expression of horror and ecstasy on their face. Number 38. The first human Bill ever contacted was Modoc the Wise, a shaman of the native group that lived in Oregon, where the town of Gravity Falls would eventually be founded. Number 39. As he did with George Washington and the Egyptians, Bill tasked Modoc with constructing a portal. Due to his limited tech capabilities, Modoc could only make it out of twigs. Number 40. When Modoc discovered the eventual apocalyptic result of his dealings with Bill, he lit himself on fire to prevent it from happening. Number 41. Soon after, the other natives found a way to defeat Bill with a zodiac of 10 symbols. They created cave paintings detailing their encounter with Bill, an incantation to summon him, and a foreboding warning to never read the incantation out loud. From there, the natives evacuated, deeming their old home cursed land due to Bill. Number 42. The rest is history. Go check out Gravity Falls if you want the whole story. As you watch the show, keep an eye out for Bill Cipher. You can see images of him throughout the entire series. In that sense, he appears in every episode of the show. Number 43. Any image of Bill you see, you can see through, too. That means he's always watching. He is the abyss that stares back. Number 44. These tiny Bill Easter eggs were deliberately included by the creators of the show as a way to let the audience know that Bill was always keeping tabs on the Pines family. Number 45. He's plastered all over the Pine's base of operations, the Mystery Shack. He's a part of the A in the Mystery Shack sign, appears on the rug in the gift shop, and is also part of the red stained glass window in the attic. Number 46. Not all of Bill's appearances are front and center though. Bill pops up on a jar of paintbrushes labeled Bill Jar and Headhunters. He's also on the back of a deck of cards in the Time Traveler's Pig. You can even see Bill on a tube of makeup in Carpet DM. Number 47. In one particular appearance, Bill shows up in Journal 2 on the $12 bill. The bill says Semper Vigilantum, translated from Latin, means always watching, a haunting hint alluding to Bill's omnipresence. Number 48. In fact, Bill is so omnipresent that he even makes cameo appearances in other shows. He pops up a couple of times on Rick and Morty, one being on a computer monitor in Big Trouble in Little Sanchez. Number 49. You can see a poster of him in Sophomore Slump, an episode of Star vs. the Forces of Evil. He also appears a number of times in the new DuckTales. Number 50. While those appearances are less obvious, there is one instance where you can't possibly miss him. In The Simpsons. In the episode Bart's in Jail, Bill Cipher appears in a mass hallucination. In this instance, he's actually the Norse god Loki, who says Bill Cipher is one of his forms. He's even voiced by Alex Hirsch. Number 51. Bill is no stranger to appearances in the real world, too. In 2013, Alex Hirsch and the Gravity Falls crew took a four-day road trip through Oregon and Northern California. Number 52. Dubbed the Mystery Tour 2013, the idea was to find the weirdest tourist traps across the region and leave drawings of Bill Cipher behind. Number 53. Hirsch and the crew would draw Bill Cipher on everything from garbage cans, telephone poles, and random signs taking pictures of the drawings and tweeting them out along the way. Number 54. From there, the Gravity Falls team issued a challenge. If fans found the Bill drawings and posted pictures of themselves at those spots, they would receive mystery prizes. Number 55. The events of Gravity Falls and Bill Cipher's evil schemes culminate in the final showdown, as depicted in Weird Mageddon Parts 1 through 3. For Weird Mageddon Part 1, Bill was actually going to have his own villain song, Number 56. 
Bill's would-be song was called It's Gonna Get Weird, but was ultimately cut from the episode due to time restraints. Number 57. You can actually still hear this song and watch the full accompanying animatic on YouTube. The song also appears as a deleted scene in the special features section of the Gravity Falls series box set. Number 58. At the end of Weird Weirdmageddon Part 3, Bill is defeated and turned into a photorealistic stone statue. The Gravity Falls creators actually had a statue of Bill made. Number 59. The end of the episode even teased the possibility that this real statue was hidden somewhere in the real world. The image is accompanied by an encoded hint that includes the phrases deep within the woods and beyond the rusty gates. Number 60. A few months after the finale of Gravity Falls, Alex Hirsch challenged fans everywhere to try and find the statue. And so the cipher hunt was officially underway. Number 61. Hirsch came up with the idea when he knew the series was coming to a close. He wanted to give fans one last mystery in a way that no show had ever done. So he went with an augmented reality game. The earlier mystery tour was kind of an ARG proof of concept for Gravity Falls. Number 62. To make the statue itself, Hirsch enlisted the help of Fawn Davis, a prop master and judge on BattleBots. Number 63. To make sure the statue was built to weather the elements, Davis made it out of plexiglass. From there, he covered it with glue that had seeds mixed into it, giving it that overgrown look like it's been lost in the wilderness for years. Number 64. With the statue made, Hirsch needed to find a spot for it. He ended up heading to Reedsport, Oregon, where he found a woman who was down to let him hide it on her property for people to find. Number 65. From there, Hirsch traveled around the world, leaving little hints for the cipher hunt as he went along. Number 66. With all of the clues and hints laid, Hirsch officially announced cipher hunt on July 20th, 2016. Number 67. But first, he laid out a few ground rules. First, he made sure to clarify that the entire game was completely unofficial. Not Disney nor any other company had anything to do with it. Cypher Hunt was entirely Alex Hirsch's creation. Number 68. Next, he was clear about discouraging trespassing and vandalism. Hirsch assured fans that every hint was in a public space, and told people to mind their surroundings and be respectful, comparing the Cypher Hunt to playing Pokemon Go. Number 69. The final and arguably most important rule was thus. If you happen to find the Bill Cipher statue, do not shake his hand. Number 70. And so, Hirsch tweeted the first image with a number of coded hints, along with the hashtag FLSKHUKXQW. Shifting those letters three letters back, the letters read out as the hashtag CypherHunt. Number 71. Using the same three-letter cipher, hunters translated messages in the tweeted image, which read, The urban legend has come true. Cypher's statue calling you. The secret map is in your hand to trace the clues across the land. And the other read, Don't forget it's all for pleasure. The hunt itself's the real treasure, but a prize awaits the first one there. Be safe, be smart, and of course, beware. Number 72. While those hints were more of an introduction, the first real hint was quickly discovered. Across both messages, the letters in red spelled out Russia. Sure enough, the first clue was found in the Kazan Cathedral in St. Petersburg. Number 73. The clue has a line that reads, Switch your rubles out for yen, confirming Japan as the location of the next hint. Number 74. More specifically, the hint gave instructions to enter a shrine with specific directions to follow until you reach the leftmost corner in the back of the shrine, and that a sword and a crescent mark the clue. Number 75. Following the directions, somebody found a spot with that exact description, locating the second hint inside of the Kondam Yojin Shrine. Number 76. Part of this second hint read, The Hunter of the Fountain of Youth, 400 before his name is written. Another key hint read, Find what's lost, in all caps, to pass the test. From a shrine that's east, to a shrine that's west. Number 77. Fans found a poster at 400 Ponce de Leon Avenue Northeast in Atlanta, Georgia. The poster was a missing person poster for Waddles, with Lost right at the top. Number 78. While the poster had some information about Waddles, including his weight and when he was last seen, there was also an encrypted message that, when decoded, read, Across from the stones of the springs, you'll find some peculiar things. Tied to a root is a lone pink key. Dig to find what waits for thee. Number 79. But that's not all. Another key hint was a phone number. 
When called, the phone number plays a message in reverse. Played properly, it's a message from Grunkle Stan. Number 80. In his message, Grunkle Stan, played by Alex Hirsch of course, said the next clue was at Ochre Court, a big old building in Rhode Island. He also said to look behind a picture of a nun, Sister Mary Hilda Miley. The Ochre Court he's referring to is a building at Sal Virginia University in Newport, Rhode Island. Number 81. Trouble was, university staff accidentally trashed the hint before the game even started, leaving cipher hunters empty-handed. The university itself even tweeted out that there were no hints on campus, but wished the hunters luck. Number 82. Thankfully, Cypher Hunt hadn't hit a dead end. Gravity Falls Cypher tweeted out some hints, including one reminding hunters of the pink key hint, and another that read, return to what was and try again while waiting for something new. Number 83. Hunters took this to mean that there's another hint back in Atlanta, until Alex Hirsch tweeted Grunkle Stan's phone number, advising hunters to leave a message. Number 84. This time, Grunkle Stan gave the hint, a man whose first name is his last, a statue honoring his past. Right behind him by the sign of his park, a golden head shows light in the dark. Number 85. Not long after, hunters found the fourth hint near the Griffith J. Griffith statue in Los Angeles' Griffith Park. This clue was a piece of paper and an invisible ink pen inside of a golden Grunkle Stan head. Number 86. The next few hints saw cipher hunters bouncing around along the west coast. A few more hints then popped up in LA, Piedmont, and even some in Oregon. The hunters were getting closer. Number 87. The clues started becoming increasingly more complex too, including cryptex wheels, locked PO boxes, and even a jigsaw puzzle. Number 88. One hint was found completely by accident. In Portland, Oregon, a fan was walking alone and noticed a garden gnome. They knew a gnome was part of the game, so they picked it up on a whim and found a viewfinder leading to another hint. Number 89. The gnome's location was supposed to be revealed on the jigsaw puzzle, so to incentivize the hunter finishing the now-revealed clue, Alex Hirsch promised to sign the completed puzzle and release the pilot of Gravity Falls. Number 90. The hint in the viewfinder under the garden gnome pointed to Confusion Hill in Mendocino County, California. There you could find a little gift shop, not unlike the Mystery Shack. Using a special password, Philbrick, a fan bought a jar of fake eyeballs with the next clue written on the underside of the lid. Number 91. The next few hints pointed to various spots in Oregon, until finally, with a hint from Alex Hirsch and an entire Polybius-based decoding, the last clue was revealed. Read Sport, Oregon. Number 92. Using a sort of treasure map that was an earlier clue, fans quickly found Bill Cipher's specific location once they'd narrowed down the city. Number 93. The first one to get there was a cipher hunter who, at the time, went by at Shadow underscore Wolfwind on Twitter. She found the statue on August 2nd, 2016 at 7.53 p.m. PDT. And with that, the hunt was over. Number 94. Other fans soon arrived and took pictures with the statue, even shaking its hand, clearly breaking the most important rule. Number 95. The hunters all worked together to dig up a treasure chest buried in front of the statue. The chest contained a bunch of stuff including fake coins, real Russian and Japanese currency, a plastic crown, and a sash that read Mayor of Gravity Falls. Number 96. Also, the treasure chest contained a copy of Journal 3 with a special message from Alex Hirsch, saying that whoever found the treasure would be the new Mayor of Gravity Falls. Sure enough, with Hirsch's blessing, at Shadow underscore Wolfwind changed her Twitter officially to at official GF Mayor. Number 97. While she was the new mayor on the books, off the books she was not actually the first one to find the statue. See, among the treasure, much of the plastic money was marked with the name Bradley. Number 98. On July 12, 2016, before the cipher hunt had even officially started, a Reedsport local named Bradley happened upon the Bill Cipher statue. He had never seen the show, so he was confused. Number 99. To get some answers, Bradley took a picture of the statue and asked around on an unsolved mystery subreddit to little avail. Luckily, the user behind at the mystery of GF's Twitter found his post before any hunters did. Number 100. Sure enough, Bradley was put into contact with Alex Hirsch, who explained the whole situation to him, rewarding him with $100 in exchange for his discretion until the hunt was over. Number 101. 
The next day, August 3rd, the Bill Cipher statue was actually taken by local authorities due to a dispute over whose property the statue was actually on. In the transport process, the statue's hat broke off. Number 102. While the statue was held at the police station, someone actually stole the hat, telling police that it was theirs. To this day, that original hat has never been recovered. Number 103. In the end, the Bill Cipher statue now resides back in Confusion Hill, California, complete with a new hat. There's even a new treasure box that the shop keeps behind the counter, a larger one to hold things that fans leave behind as a tribute to Bill and the Cipher Hunt. Number 104. Before Bill Cipher was erased from existence at the end of Gravity Falls, in 2015 he did hold a 60-minute Ask Me Anything on Reddit to answer questions from fans directly. Number 105. He took the opportunity to clarify a few interesting points. For one, he briefly explained that using Dreamcatchers won't keep him from invading your dreams. They just tickle him. Number 106. If you were wondering, his favorite solar system is that of Tagiak. For the record, that is what Earth was once called, according to Scientology. Number 107. Oh, when he also answered the most burning question of all. Despite his seemingly infinite powers, no. Bill Cipher cannot see why kids love the taste of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. He admitted so himself. Thanks to the very nature of Gravity Falls, plenty goes unexplained. Much of the history of the tiny town is left shrouded in darkness, only revealed through newspaper clippings and quick character moments. In fact, all of those mysteries we just went through only added to the collective cluster funk that made fans' brains fire on all cylinders. To keep you postulating and prophesizing, here are the top Gravity Falls theories featuring Lou Tunes. Since our Gravity Falls episode last year, the show has aired another season, and naturally has sparked like a million more conspiracies. Seriously, this season has been crazy from zombies to terrifying shapeshifters to sock puppet operas, and we're finally getting answers to some of our biggest theories. So many mysteries have been solved, but now even more questions are being asked. It was way too hard to pick just one. So today, Chad and I are here to cover our favorite Gravity Falls conspiracies from season two so far. And obviously, if you haven't caught up with season two or haven't even seen Gravity Falls, we will be covering some very, very big spoilers. So take this as your warning. Now, here are our top Gravity Falls conspiracies. Rick and Morty and Gravity Falls are connected. Yes, Rick and Morty, the hilariously raunchy Adult Swim show about a Doc Brown-like grandpa, his wimpy grandkid, and their adventures across the universe. Could it be tied to Disney's Gravity Falls? Well, in the Gravity Falls episode Society of the Blind Eye, Grunkle Stan's pen, notepad, and mug get sucked into the portal. In Rick and Morty, close Rick encounters of a Rick kind. A pen, notepad, and mug fall through a portal onto another planet. And you can tell it's the same ones because of the question mark on the mug. Now, we don't know much about Stan's portal yet, but we've got a pretty good idea that it transcends our universe. Now, right now, nothing has been confirmed about a connection between either shows, and it just kind of exists as an Easter egg. But we know for sure it was intentional because both creators, Alex Hirsch and Justin Roiland, are friends. In fact, Roiland even lends his voice to the Gravity Falls character, Blendin Blandin. Will something come of this in the future? Well, who knows, but it's definitely pretty cool. Bipper has returned. If you can recall, in the season 2 episode, Sock Opera, Dipper makes a deal with Bill Cipher in exchange for the laptop's password. Rookie mistake, Dipper. Even though Dipper defeats Bill at the end of the episode, some believe that Bill still lingers in Dipper's mind. Specifically in the episode, Northwest Mansion Mystery. People think that because of the tapestry of Bill, that he might be present in the house. And they might be right. Because when Dipper is turned into wood, his pose is very similar to his final form that the shapeshifter predicts in Into the Bunker, meaning Dipper is practically dead at this point. So that is the perfect time for Bill to take over. And if you notice, Dipper kind of starts acting a little differently. Known for his slightly high-strung and paranoid personality, Dipper tells old man McGucket to just party when warning them about the end of the world in the last few minutes of the episode. Not a huge red flag, sure, but notice how he walks with his hands on his hips. Dipper only ever walked like that when Bill was possessing him. Also, in the season two mid-season finale, Not What He Seems, Dipper seems persistent on not letting Stan open the portal at the end of the episode. 
It's possible it might be because he didn't trust Stan, or if he was really under the influence of Bill, it could be because he didn't want Stan's brother, presumably his greatest threat, to return. And Bill would need a physical form to stop that from happening in order to not raise any suspicions. So this behind the scenes possession isn't unreasonable. In the same scene, Dipper slash Bipper tackles Stan in order to stop him from opening the portal. A very un-Dipper thing to do. On the other hand, he did lose his trust for Stan and wanted to protect Mabel, so it's not 100% out of the realm of possibility that that was uh, all Dipper. But then again, if you look at Dipper's eyes right as the portal is opening, they look a lot like they did when Bill was in charge. So there could still be a little bit of Bipper left inside of him. Stan's tattoo. Ever since the Dipper's Guide to the Unexplained Short Stan's Tattoo, this topic has been a very controversial one. What is Stan's tattoo and why is he trying so hard to cover it up? I mean, it's clearly a big deal if even Bill remembers it in Dreamscapers. In his Reddit AMA, Bill said that Stan's tattoo means watch your step. But we all know he can't be trusted, so why should we believe this? And in fact, we just learned in the episode Tale of Two Stans that Stan's tattoo isn't a tattoo at all. It's actually a burn scar. There's one moment in the episode Land Before Swine where you can see it from a distance, but it doesn't look like what we've seen before. But during Stan's fantasy sequence, we can see it in full view. It appears to say OLHV, which decoded in Caesar cipher means lies. But this sequence is all in Stan's mind. We can't take any of this as true. So there goes that idea. Now we know that the symbol is the same one engraved on the side of the console. Some think it could be some sort of map to Gravity Falls. But a more likely explanation is that it's actually an alchemical sigil, or an alchemy equation. Douglas Mackerel, a major Gravity Falls fan, made a video decoding all of Stan's tattoos. And here's what he figured out. The circle on top symbolizes power and the sun. The W's on the side are a symbol for autocumulus clouds. Autocumulus clouds are also called a mackerel sky, referring to the secret society of the Royal Order of the Holy Mackerel. And it's been said in the Gravity Falls game on Disney Channel's website that Stan is in a secret society. Another interesting note, autocumulus clouds are often mistaken for UFOs because of their shape. Moving on, the arrow with two dots underneath it mean a powerful sacred ground which could indicate where the portal is located. The circle in the diamond actually doesn't exist as an alchemical symbol. However, the diamond means the four elements, earth, air, water, and fire. And the circle symbolizes a door. Together, they could mean a door to the world or even all of space and time. And the fact that the sigil is perfectly symmetrical horizontally, it could be interpreted as two suns circling two skies and two grounds separated by space and time. Also, if you look at the first part of the tattoo, you can clearly draw a triangle around it, which looks an awfully lot like the portal. And if we look at the triangle, it points to the thing at the bottom of the tattoo. Now that last symbol actually isn't an alchemical symbol at all. It's a Native American symbol. The two arrows pointing at the circle means warding off of evil spirits. Possibly a triangular shaped top hat wearing spirit? Naturally, nothing has been confirmed in the show yet. Hopefully we'll learn more about it in the rest of season two. Robbie is a zombie. It's no secret that Robbie is pale, lethargic, angsty, and can basically always be found wearing eye makeup. But is this just because he's a teenager? Or is it because he's actually a zombie? The journal describes zombies as known for their pale skin and their bad attitude. These creatures are often mistaken for teenagers. That sure sounds a lot like Robbie to me. Not only that, but Mabel's boyfriend, whom Dipper mistakes for a zombie in the episode Tourist Trapped, has some very pale skin, swoopy bangs, and a black hoodie, much like Robbie does or really anyone that spends a lot of time at Hot Topic. However, Robbie looks nothing like the zombies that Dipper summons in the episode Scaryoki. So he's either got some really good makeup and a solid supply of brains to keep him sane, or he's just a regular teenage boy. But I guess we won't know for sure until he hears the three-part harmony from Taking Over Midnight. Gideon is immortal. 
Even though he ends up behind bars at the end of the first season, we all know that Gideon is definitely up to something fishy. Whether it was just to win Mabel over, get vengeance on Stan, or achieve ultimate power, this phony kid psychic pulled some straight up evil stunts way out of the range of any normal kid's ability. One explanation for this is that Gideon is a supernatural creature with immortal abilities. Gideon is the only kid in the show to have five fingers. The adults are the only other characters to have five fingers. He has very mature language for a kid. He even refers to Grunkle Stan as Stanford. And in the episode Blendon's Game, when Dipper and Mabel go back into Seuss's childhood, they pass a billboard for Bud's Auto having a Just Had a Baby sale. However, baby is crossed out and replaced with demon. Also, his parents never seem to refer to him as son, only by his name or boy. Initially, many people thought Gideon was a vampire because of this adorable comparison. However, that's been mostly debunked throughout the show, because Gideon can see his reflection and be out in the sunlight, things that not even Edward Cullen can do. But the immortal part still stands. We first meet Gideon in the episode, The Hand That Rocks Mabel, which is a play on the phrase, The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, referring to a person dating someone much younger than them. So it could be that Gideon is bent on getting all of the journals just to get his vampire powers back. However, another theory states that maybe he wants the journals back because he was somehow involved with the Pines but somehow an incident with them turned him into a baby. This could all explain his knowledge of the supernatural plus his vendetta against the Pines. Aliens and Gravity Falls. With all of the interdimensional portals and time travel, crazy creatures and zombies, it's not too hard to believe that Gravity Falls could also have been home to aliens. I mean, there are a lot of major clues that would indicate some extraterrestrial residents living in Gravity Falls. Number one being the giant UFO shaped hole in the mountains above Gravity Falls, which is referred to in the journals as floating cliffs, with notes about gravitational anomalies and how they're not naturally occurring. But there are also several other references to UFOs hidden throughout the show. They can be seen in a Polaroid during the theme song as well as on the main title card in the corner. You can also see a magazine dedicated to UFO sightings and Grunkle Stan reading about a UFO sham in the Gravity Falls Gossiper. And the creepiest sign of all, the same UFOs from the theme song also show up on Bill Cipher in the episode Dreamscape. And get this, there is even a UFO in the unaired pilot of Gravity Falls. So you just know that aliens have always been a crucial part of the Gravity Falls mystery. The portal was used before. Even though we were just introduced to the portal, there are already a ton of conspiracies involving its use. The biggest one being that the portal was used before the author, Stan's twin brother, fell in 30 years ago and was trapped. It's stated in the journal that the author built the portal in order to gain knowledge on the mysteries of Gravity Falls, but instead it brought destruction. As we all know, Bill exists in a different dimension, and the interdimensional portal may have been how he came to Gravity Falls in the first place, a time he refers to in the episode Dreamscapers. We now know that the portal was opened again when Stanford was caught in it. But it's possible that the portal was used by Ford many other times before this one. Maybe as an attempt to return Bill, as evident by the page in the journal we catch a glimpse of during Into the Bunker. Maybe depicting some interdimensional exploration or retrieval. So what could prove this? Well, there are quite a lot of other references referring to this supernatural incident that occurred 30 years ago. And Scarioki, Agent Powers stated that they haven't seen readings like this for 30 years. And based on what McGucket said in Society of the Blind Eye, that he can't remember anything before 1982, it must mean that the portal was first opened that same year. Also in Society of the Blind Eye, we see a graph in McGucket's lab that indicates that the portal becomes more unstable as time passes. Perhaps the author may have used it many times before that day happened. And that's why Ford appeared so frantic when Stan finally saw him for the first time after 10 years. All right, I know we've spent a lot of this video talking about the unknowable aspects of Gravity Falls, so why not take a little break for some feel-good content? The mysteries weren't the only things keeping people engaged. Gravity Falls has a heart that few shows can hold a candle to, and it ended up teaching us a lot about life. I'm sure a lot of longtime fans were positively impacted by the show at its core. Without further ado, let's jump into 13 Gravity Falls life lessons. We know you're still upset that Gravity Falls is over. So are we. The inhabitants of the Mystery Shack left such a deep mark on anybody lucky enough to have watched the show in its initial run. We laughed, we cried, and when you think about it, 
we learned some pretty intense life lessons along the way. I'm Neil McNeil, and today on Channel Frederator, we're gonna be doing some deep thinking for you all because we know how much you love it when we overanalyze your favorite cartoons. So get ready because we're counting down the 13 best life lessons that Gravity Falls ever taught us. Let's get started. Number 13, know your audience. Let's start off with something vague but important. For any kind of performer, politician, or businessman, knowing your audience is the key to success. If you want to flourish, you have to be savvy enough to know how to address people in a way that inspires. If you make a terrible TV commercial where you joke that most people make it out alive, or try to win your electoral base over by arguing that the Statue of Liberty is our hottest landmark, chances are you won't get very far. Watch Stan Pines, do the opposite, and you'll get in great shape. But this point goes both ways, considering that the main antagonist of the series is someone who has the power to possess bodies and will lie to you in order to get what he wants. One of Phil Cipher's major strengths is his ability to manipulate your desires to his advantage. In other words, he knows his audience and will play the part he needs to to succeed. Everyone falls for it at some point. Dipper, Mabel, Ford, Gideon, Bill's a more capable con man than Stan. So it's smart to maintain some skepticism when dealing with salesmen, politicians, or anyone else trying to persuade you to do something. Number 12, reality is an illusion. The universe is a hologram by gold. Aha, you didn't think Bill Cipher could give some sound advice, did you? I mean, we don't think the universe is a hologram and if you can afford it, buying gold can be a pretty good idea. But this line seems to be Gravity Falls' more tongue-in-cheek version of a similar but more somber line from its sibling series, Rick and Morty. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Come watch TV. Which brings us to Bill's first point, reality is an illusion. This is coming from someone who, in a very large way, is himself an illusion because he can only exist in the mindscape until the rip. And while there are no mind-hopping demigods, I mean, as far as we know, it's worth taking a second to pause and consider the subjectiveness of reality. After all, nobody exists on purpose, right? And your life experiences aren't anything like that of your mom, your dad, your friends, or your neighbors due to your own experiences, how your mind works, what complexes or fears or dreams you may have, any number of factors. These nuances in personal experience are what Bill preys on, so he should know. And while we might have just freaked you out, the beauty here is that all this makes you unique. Unless you get into all those multi-dimensional Rick and Morty shenanigans, but even then there's the Rickiest Rick. Some people, like Bill, use their train of thought as an excuse to become a monster, follow the belief that they're better than everybody else. So to ground yourself, remember, nobody exists on purpose. See, we just took a funny quote and threw some major existentialist philosophy on you. Number 11, a blank slate isn't a clean one. There's an entire secret society in Gravity Falls dedicated to erasing people's memories when something traumatizing happens. But the Society of the Blind Eye's supposed trauma scale stretches from mildly surprising to life ruining. Nobody has ever used the memory erasing gun more than poor old man McGucket who had a good reason to want to forget whatever horrors he may have witnessed in Bill's dimension. But who paid for his supposed peace of mind? The fact is, McGucket still suffers from a vague, ominous feeling, and now he's aged and lost his mind as well. Which brings us to our lesson, a blank slate isn't a clean one. In other words, our friends Timon and Pumbaa lied to us with the whole Hakuna Matata ordeal. The past occurred whether you remember it or not, and you're not better off running away from it, even if you wish every day that you could forget it. If anything, avoiding trauma experiences can often have more dire consequences than facing them head on. Let's say, in McGucket's case, insanity. Unfortunately, terrible things happen to good people every single day. The best you can do is take whatever lessons you can from the situation and learn to move on. By the time Grunkle Stan is zapped, losing his memories is recognized as being a real sacrifice and a tragedy. Although, granted, Stan didn't have the baggage that McGucket does. But imagine if McGucket hadn't memory gunned himself every day for so long. Sure, we'd be missing our favorite Gravity Falls character, but McGucket himself would have been much better off in the long run. Number 10, don't pine for what you can't attain. No pun intended here, folks. Okay, a little pun intended. Like we discussed in our last lesson, many of us have deep scars within our past that are a source of struggle. Some people, like McGucket, try to forget these painful experiences altogether. But for many, many others like Seuss, these unresolved burdens are a constant source of struggle. You just can't quite get away from them, and certain triggers, like birthdays for instance, just happen to make it worse, and you don't know what to do to get some sort of resolution on the matter. But chances are the answer is right in front of you. Even though we may not realize it, many of us are lucky enough to have people in our lives that would, if given the opportunity, 
go through some sort of time gladiator fight just to make us happy. That's what family and true friendship is. We can't change the past, well, without a time wish at least, but even given the opportunity to use the time wish to see his long lost father, Seuss realizes that there's nothing his father could offer him that he doesn't already have in the present, genuine affection. He sees that he was allowing something painful in his past to get the better of him, to the extent that he wasn't able to see the people in the present who had been reaching out to him this whole time. If you keep <coughs> pining for something in your past, you won't be able to appreciate what you have in the present. Number 9. Morality is relative. When Mabel says this out of nowhere at the very end of the last Mabel corn, its bluntness hits you square in the face. Maybe it hits so hard now because it's an election year, and a heated one at that. On a daily basis, you hear candidates and their supporters spouting beliefs you cannot for the life of you understand. And when people don't agree or won't try to understand other people's beliefs, there's bound to be confrontation at some point. But there's a key distinction to be made between wrong and different, and sometimes that's a hard call to make. In Celeste Bell Belathabelle's case, she was using an impossibly high moral bar to make Mabel's suffer just for the fun of it. She deserved a good punching. But there are real people that may hold that same high moral bar against you and make you feel like a bad person when you're not. Nobody's perfect and no one agrees on everything. While it's important to hear other people out, Mabel learns that there's no absolute answer for what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes you just gotta stick to what you believe is right and hold on for dear life. Number 8. Be wary of tunnel vision. We're defining tunnel vision as being so focused on a goal that you only look straight ahead blinding yourself to what's happening around you and therefore becoming inflexible, to the detriment of achieving what you're actually trying to do. Sound familiar? Because we're looking at you, Ford. Also, Bill. It's something they have in common. Ford's main problem is that whatever he's working on, be it building the portal or sealing the rift, that's all he thinks about. Sure, he cherishes his relationship with Dipper, but Dipper also serves some utilitarian value. It's great to be focused on a goal, especially when it comes to the security of the entire universe. The problem arises when you fail to take into account the people around you because, in the end, they have just as much to say in what you're trying to do as you do. When Ford is working on something, he shuts himself off from everyone and thinks in terms of his project. So when Ford asked Stan to come help with the portal, it never even entered his mind that Stan might be a little angry with him, which of course leads Ford to being sent to another dimension for 30 years. Dipper comes close to making the same mistake. He almost allows Ford to talk him into ditching California and becoming his apprentice. It would be an amazing opportunity for him, but Dipper fails to take Mabel into consideration, which also very much much comes back to haunt him. That's adult life, kids. You're not in charge. Because Ford and Dipper aren't taking into account how nothing ever goes as planned. Boom. Weird Mageddon. Tunnel vision even accounts for Bill's downfall. If he wasn't so single-mindedly giddy about getting Ford's secrets, he may have thought to pause so he could realize he wasn't entering Ford's head at all. It's a pretty basic mistake, Bill, even though it worked out in favor for everybody else. Number 7. Teamwork, man! We know it's cliche, but all this talk about tunnel vision leads us into our next lesson, that you can accomplish so much more together than you could ever accomplish alone. Although Ford tries to shoulder as much Bill-related dealings himself as he can, everyone, including Ford, realizes that Bill is not the kind of multidimensional entity that can be stopped by just one person. But by working together, people can become more than the sum of their parts. Like that awesome mystery shack transformer. Everyone present in the shack has an indispensable role in the plan, and they accomplish the near impossible task of attacking Bill's pyramid. The principle even reduces right down to Dipper and Mabel themselves. As Wendy points out, when the two of them work together, they can figure out a way to accomplish anything. On the other hand, it takes one person to ruin a good thing. The perfect metaphor for this appears right in the show. When everyone creates the almighty Zodiac to stop Bill, it takes Grunkle, Stan, and Ford in turn to keep the circle from being complete. Then everything falls apart and people are turned into terrifying but admittedly epic banners. I mean, I would totally buy replicas of all of those, even though they're beacons for human suffering. But again, how is Will beat? By Stan and Ford reconciling their differences and, oh yeah, teaming up. See what we mean? Number 6. Holding a grudge is never healthy. While we're on the topic of Stan and Ford, these two brothers are the center point of the later episode's focus of forgiveness and how holding a grudge gets you nowhere. Ford blames Stan for being sucked through the portal. When Stan opens the portal again, he's hoping to let bygones be bygones, but Ford is still angry, which in turn makes Stan angry. Instead of working this out like good adults, they just avoid each other, allowing their anger to keep stewing unresolved, which causes the whole teamwork thing to fall apart 
and you end up right back at the Zodiac issue and people trapped in banners. That unresolved anger leads Team Gravity Falls from almost defeating Bill to him regaining the upper hand. There's a smaller scale version of this lesson in Roadside Attraction when Stan wants to get back at the other Oregon tour traps for their pranks, stops and disrupts each stop, and in return Jess gets pranked by everybody else all over again, starting up a never-ending wheel of pranking. Point is, sometimes you'll be in a situation where you believe that you're in the right, but nobody's apologizing and so everyone involved continues to nurse these grudges. And as we've seen, grudges get uglier over time. It's hard to swallow your pride, let something go, and be the first one to apologize, but you certainly won't regret that as much as the disruptive consequences of your unending grudge. Number 5. Manliness is overrated We learned multiple times in Gravity Falls that the more machismo way to do things, like fighting and general feats of strength, aren't the best way to get anything accomplished at all. Specifically, Dipper is so ashamed that he can't pass some lame manliness test and doesn't have any chest hair that he almost kills an innocent creature to complete his man's formation. The epitome of manliness here are the Manators, who start fights at the slightest excuse, are proud, and build things just to tear them down. Not a flattering portrait of machismo. Manliness is all about honor and glory, but there's nothing glorious about ordering a kid to kill a scary looking but harmless creature. All the Ubermen in the show, including a character named Manly Dan, are shown to be all brawn and no brain. So that when it comes down to Weird Mageddon, someone like Wendy, who's part brawn and part brain, is way more of an asset to the team. Plus, the straight up brawling championed by the Manators is shown to be a terrible, inconclusive way to deal with your problems. Take for example how Rumble McSkirmish's victory over Dipper is a loss for him. We can also learn that fighting over a girl is stupid. But anyway, Dipper realizes that manliness isn't all it's cracked up to be when he and the multi-bear bond over girly pop band Baba. If a freaking multi-bear listens to Baba, why can't it be manly? And who's to say anything's girly anyway? Or that manly is good for Dipper but girly is bad? Anyone worth hanging out with has a little bit of both. Which leads me to my next lesson, number four, never underestimate the lady. Let's face it kids, sexism and misogyny are definitely still a thing. And outside of that, there are so many cartoons out there that have maybe two women in the cast who are both just side characters. Happily, this climate is changing thanks to shows like Steven Universe and I would argue Gravity Falls, which boasts Mabel and Wendy as two of the primary moral compasses of the show. Add Candy, Grenda, and even Pacifica into the mix, and you've got yourself a crowd of powerful ladies. Who defies her parents and saves everyone in her home from a horrifying ghost? Pacifica, who literally punts Lil Gideon and is the biggest badass of the series? Wendy, and of course there's Mabel, who's done too many good things in this show to count, all in her distinctly Mabel, not so manly at all way, and having a hero whose heroic qualities are quintessentially feminine is a big deal. In addition, there's an entire episode of the series devoted to a Just the Gals mission where they confront and beat up an effing unicorn, the greatest of feminine stereotypes. And the Mystery Shack is saved from Weird Mageddon because of it. These ladies accomplish so much just by using the skills, imagination, and moral compass that they already have at their fingertips. Do the other characters expect these ladies to succeed as much as they do? No, not really. It's always kind of a surprise to the onlookers. So that's the lesson, never underestimate the lady. Number three, never be ashamed of who you are. At some point, you'll come across someone who seems so darn confident that you'll begin to doubt yourself or someone who will use one of your traits as fodder to embarrass you. But you'll slowly begin to learn that when somebody makes fun of you, it's either in good loving jest or due to some kind of insecurity on their own part however absurd that might seem. Pacifica has a real need to feel superior to other people, and all the better if she has an audience to amplify her spotlight. That's why she loves taking down Mabel. Point is, it's not your problem, it's theirs. When you start being too concerned about how other people see you, it's easy to freak out and think that you're somehow not good enough in some way. But no matter how deep the jabs may be, or how your inner dialogue may create a convincing argument for your own inadequacy, learn to always brush it off and stay true to yourself. As they say in some circles, you are the best you. It's dangerous to worry too much about how other people think of you. Who cares anyway? And if you do try to change something about yourself to please others, 
you'll soon learn how that trait really did serve you better than this new affectation. That it might be valuable in some way that you never quite expected. Not all of us have access to a voice changing serum, so we can't experiment to the extent that Dipper does, but that's what cartoons are for. And why do you want to experiment like that anyway? Weren't you listening? Jeez. Number two, you can't force someone to love you. Dipper hits the nail on the head with this one. You can't force someone to love you. All you can do is strive to be a person worth loving. Few romantic relationships in Gravity Falls work out, except for Derland and Blups, of course, and Robbie and Tambri. But as for Dipper and Wendy, Robbie and Wendy, Lil Gideon and Mabel, you get the picture. Most of the romantic affections in Gravity Falls are tragically unrequited. And when you're in love with someone who doesn't love you back, you can get kind of desperate to impress them, like throwing an epic sock puppet opera or breaking up your crush and their present significant other. But you can't make somebody fall in love with you. Gravity Falls drove this point home so hard that they introduced a character with the power to make people fall in love, and the outcome was the same. You can't say what's better for other people, and you can't force something to happen if it's not the right time. And everyone in an unrequited relationship in Gravity Falls becomes a better person because of the experience. Take Dipper and Wendy, whose friendship reached a profound depth that couldn't have been accessed in some kind of weird, awkward romantic relationship. Or Lil Gideon, who learned the power of doing the right thing just for the hell of it. Even when relationships don't turn out how you want them to, or don't turn out at all, there's something even more valuable to be learned from the rejection. And like Dipper Sensei said, all you can do is move on and try to absorb that lesson so that you can become the best person you can be. And finally, lesson number one, change just is. And don't be afraid of the future. We've all reached a pivotal junction at some point in our lives where we knew everything was about to change and were terrified because we didn't know what was going to come next. It's impossible to know what the future may hold, unless you're Blendon Bladlin, maybe, but he doesn't even seem to be doing that well. Anyway, when facing such an intimidating unknown, it's easy to give into the assumption that whatever the future holds will be worse, and that different is bad. When you reach this point in life, or maybe even after you've crossed it, the desire for things to just stay as they were in the good old golden days may become unbearable. But change is a natural part of life, whether it's leaving the place you called home or growing up. And as Mabel and Dipper both learned, nothing is built to last forever. No good ever comes from stopping what's natural and inevitable. I mean, Bill uses the tantalizing offer to make summer last forever as the catalyst for Weird Mageddon. And you don't trust Bill to have your best interests in mind, do you? <laughs> besides the advice we discussed earlier. But to sum up, change isn't a bad thing or a good thing. It just is. No matter how hard you fight, change will happen. And if you embrace it, you can have a large say in how your future will turn out better for you. The lesson bears repeating because it's hard. This kind of junction will happen multiple times in your life, and part of you may want to just kick and scream the entire time. So again, change just is. Dipper and Mabel learned it, and that counts for something. Dance break. Here's a video putting together Dipper and Mabel's ultimate playlist. Make sure you let us know what other tunes we should add down in the comments. Ever wonder what Dipper and Mabel listen to when they're not tending to the Mystery Shack or trying to solve the multitudinous mysteries of the journals? So do we. That's why we at Channel Frederator decided to look into the matter and take a few educated guesses. Parody songs come up in the show at a number of key points. Baba's Dancing Girl and the 80s this crowd pleasingest song Don't Start Unbelieving are hilarious and wonderful. But we wanted to translate those into real world music. We can't know if the songs here are songs that exist in this universe. That said, we know from Bill Cipher's AMA that there's at least some crossover. Bill's favourite music is 10 hours riving shepherd tone after all. I'm one chop and I've already done the courtesy of <coughs> borrowing Dipper and Mabel's iPods so we can take a quick peek at their favourite tunes. Let's dive in. First on Dipper's playlist is Head Over Heels by Tears For Fears. Dipper and Mabel both have soft spots for 80s music. Dipper does want to be alone with Wendy to talk about the weather or anything else for that matter. He also enjoys playing air synth at the beginning of the song. If Dipper were to play an instrument, my money would be on the guitar. Next we have Madonna with Like a Virgin. 
As Dipper kept exploring 80s pop, he stumbled into music way more embarrassing than Baba. That, of course, sported the unfortunate characteristic of being incredibly infectious. Like a Virgin, it's the best song Dipper wishes he never heard. So far, no one's caught him singing along to it, but he lives in constant fear of Stan and or Mabel materialising around a corner while he belts out the chorus. Next, Gorillaz with On Melancholy Hill. A quintessential song for those suffering from unrequited love. Dipper saves it for when his pursuit of Wendy is at its lowest point, and prefers listening to it while lying face up in his bed and following up with a good heartbroken groan. <sighs> Next is Meet the Elements by They Might Be Giants. Dip is a smart guy, and he likes songs that appeal to his intellect. Meet the Elements isn't the most complicated song, but he still likes it, and as an added bonus, it's a song about change, which has been on his mind a lot. They're growing up, and things are changing a lot. So a song that looks at change as neither good nor bad, but just the reality of life, appeals to him. Next is a good old classic, Michael Jackson with Smooth Criminal. Every day, Dipper tries to get some quality time in front of the bathroom mirror to practice his moonwalk. He imagines himself as the romanticized hero come to save Annie. Next, the Decemberists with the Sporting Light. Dipper likes the Decemberists because their advanced vocabulary makes him feel smarter. He took particular shining to this song because he had a similar experience playing Little League Soccer in 2010. J Dilla, EMC Squared, Instrumental. Dipper stumbled upon this song while going down a Google hole as he was researching new strategies for dungeons, dungeons, and more dungeons. He later learned that J Dilla is widely considered hip and continues to feel proud of himself that he discovered Dilla first of anyone he knows. In his half-hearted belief, this, in turn, makes him hip. Next is the good old Ghostbusters theme song. Dipper knows the Ghostbusters theme is cliche, but he was called to the Northwest Mansion to bust a ghost. He can resist the urge to hum it on the walk over. You can fight a ghost, but you can't fight the Ghostbusters theme. Muse, Knights of Sidonia. Pump up songs are a particular favourite of Dipper's, and Knights of Sidonia makes him feel like he's a majestic knight galloping through the universe upon his mighty steed. With that last refrain stuck in his head, Dipper can fight Bill Cipher all day. Plus, what kid nowadays doesn't like Muse when they're 12 or 13 or, you know, way older? Next is Bjork, Army of Me. Another excellent pump-up song and one of Dipper's favourite confidence boosters to boot. Additionally, he often uses the bass line to practice his head banging. In the bathroom mirror, as always. He'll never admit it out loud, but Dipper likes Bjork's swan dress. And finally on Dipper's playlist, Queen with Flash Gordon. Many boys discover Queen in middle school, and Dipper is no exception. Despite his sense of humility and all the adrenaline pumping through his veins, Dipper couldn't get the so dog of the universe bit out of his head as he and Mabel were being chased by Bill in the pyramid. Kicking off Mabel's playlist is Backstreet Boys' Larger Than Life. Backstreet Boys are one of the many real-world versions of several times. They're an ideal addition to Mabel's boy band catalogue, as singing along with Larger Than Life has a way of making her feel like a real champ. In fact, it's her newest karaoke go-to. Side note, Mabel loves everyone and everything. The fact that we're putting a Backstreet Boys song on here doesn't mean she weighs in on the Backstreet Boys versus NSYNC. Next is Everything is Awesome from the Lego Movie. Mabel sings this around the Mystery Shack all the time. It annoys the bejeebas out of Grunkle Stan to the point where he banned this song and all things Lego Movie related, but Mabel ignores this rule. Next is Piggies by the Beatles. Mabel doesn't care this song makes fun of the bourgeois, he just cares that he says the word Piggies. She has a full dance routine choreographed with Waddles. Next, Pink Floyd with the Gnome. Little known fact that we totally made up. Mabel loves Sid Barrett era of Pink Floyd, purely for its oddball quality. However, she wasn't able to bring herself to listen to this song for a couple of months after the whole gnome wife debacle. Next is Sam Cooke with Cupid. When Mabel was in the throes of her career as a matchmaker, she considered Cupid one of the many potential theme songs for her budding business. After the ordeal with the love god, she saved it for special occasions. Next is Beastie Boys with Intergalactic. 
Mabel's Ideal Pump-Up Song. It's helpful for dealing with multidimensional villains. Unlike Dipper, Mabel has no problem selling her performances. Most of her friends think she has accomplished the impossible feat of memorizing all the lyrics, but truth is, she still fakes her way through about half of it. Next is Toon Yards with Business. Mel Garbus is Mabel's role model. She has tried emulating Garbus's face paint from the business music video a couple times, to surprising success. This is one of her favorite songs to shout along to. She's even called Dipper her nits on several occasions. Next is Parliament with Flashlight. Many people claim to have spirit animals, but funk is Mabel's spirit music. She can listen to the 11 minute extended version of the song and still keep dancing even after Candy and Grenda have retired to the benches. Finally, Sly and the Family Stone with Hot Fun in the Summertime. We all know how much Mabel loves summer. She was planning on playing this song at least five times during her and Dipper's 13th birthday party. She doesn't quite realize the double meaning of the phrase hot fun yet. Rounding things off, we've got a playlist of music that both Dipper and Mabel enjoy equally. First up is Toto with Africa. Like we said earlier, both Dipper and Mabel contain the adoration 80s music that's common in people who aren't alive in the 80s. Toto is one of their newer discoveries, and for a solid week they blasted this song in the attic while spinning with palms outstretched in slow, triumphant circles, as if they were experiencing the rain down in Africa first then. Grunkle Stan always hated this song, being more of a Springsteen man himself, and put it on the same band list as Everything Is Awesome. Next, Sparks with Mustache. Mabel used this song to cheer up Dipper after his clash with the Manators. She introduced a dance comprised of placing your finger beneath your nose and pretending you had a real mustache. At one point, Mabel tried to take the routine to the next level through taking tweezers and stealing some of Grunkle Stan's arm hairs whilst he was still asleep. This of course failed and Mustache was placed on an even deeper band list than Everything Is Awesome or Toto. The punishment for breaking the band was cleaning Stan's hairs out of the sink and shower for the rest of the summer. Black Sabbath and Paranoid. After the Toto and Sparks incidents, Grunkle Stan attempted to initiate Dipper and Mabel into the world of classic rock, and he very much started with the deep dark world of Black Sabbath. Dipper and Mabel loved Paranoid for its extra hard rocking qualities and started blasting it every night while jumping on their beds. Stan added Paranoid to the band list and gave up on cultivating Dipper and Mabel's music tastes. Next, we've got the residents with Constantinople. Neither Dipper nor Mabel remembers which one of them stumbled on this song or how. Mabel thinks she may have used it to underscore history project on the Roman Empire, but has a hard time remembering the cause of most of her teacher's grimaces. Regardless, they remain cautiously intrigued by this song. One time they played it for Zeus and he ran out the room. Things getting a bit anime with the pillows, ride on shooting star. McGucket wasn't the only person to receive personal anime lessons from Zeus. In a very risky move, he introduced Dipper and Mabel into the slight deeper cuts of the genre with Booby Cooney because it's short and he thought Mabel might like Haraka. The two of them were overwhelmed by the intense visual style of the series, but liked it overall, and had the ending theme stuck in their heads for weeks afterwards. Finally, David Bowie with Changes. Changes was playing on the radio as Dipper and Mabel climbed into their parents' car, fresh off the bus from Gravity Falls. Enormous coincidence aside, it's become their anthem for embracing the unknowns of the future, as well as a nice melancholic reminder of their time in Gravity Falls. Admit it, with all the talk of live action remakes going on lately, you've come up with your own half-baked fan cast of Netflix's Gravity Falls. I know technically it's a Disney-owned property, but which streaming service has more success with bringing cartoons into the real world right now? Well, after Gravity Falls officially ended over more than half a decade ago, the Frederator team decided to put together their own LA Gravity Falls game plan. Enjoy! In previous videos, we discussed the entertainment world's penchant for taking animated properties and adapting them into live-action films and series. To varying degrees of success, we've seen this happen with everything from Marvel superheroes to Alvin and the Chipmunks. As vexing as this can be to cartoon purists, it makes sense. Fans always want more of their favorite cartoons and shows, and studios like a sure thing, with a lot of sequels attached. And we're still surprised that Alvin and the Chipmunks is considered a sure thing. Recently, we did a video where we imagined what it'd be like if Steven Universe was transformed from a cartoon into a live action series or film, and you guys' response was great. You had a lot of strong opinions and arguments for which actors you preferred, and we had a great time making those casting choices. 
With that in mind, we decided to look at the world of fantastical fandoms to see if there were any other shows that deserved the casting couch treatment. Naturally, it wasn't long before we arrived in the sleepy little town of Gravity Falls. My name is Tim, and today on Channel Frederator, we're looking at our top casting choices for a live-action Gravity Falls. Let's get started. Forrest Wheeler as Dipper Pines Ambitious, headstrong, and optimistic, Dipper Pines is the driving force of the show's investigations into the paranormal. As such, we need an actor whose endless charm and energy suggest they might be willing to dive headfirst into the mysterious unknown. We think Forrest Wheeler, who can be seen as the oddly mature Emery on Fresh Off the Boat, brings the enthusiasm needed to encapsulate what Dipper is all about. As noted, Forrest has mastered the ability of portraying a maturity beyond his years, which is essential for conveying Dipper's seriousness about solving the mystery of Gravity Falls. Beyond that though, Dipper does bring a sense of fun, and Wheeler, whose proven comedic talents on the popular sitcom, also has the chops to make the most of Dipper's lighter moments as well. Furthermore, we just saw a photo of Wheeler in a super cute lamb costume, which makes us want to see him try the Lammy Lammy dance. Look at that, it's a perfect match! Isabella Cavetti Cramp as Mabel Pines. While we realize it's hard to separate Kristen Schaal's frenetic energy from the identity of Mabel Pines, the 30 Rock actress is sadly too old to portray her in the flesh. As such, we need to look to someone who's able to capture Mabel's fiery enthusiasm and sense of wonder. In the recent Oscar-nominated film Joy, young actress Isabella Cavetti Cramp portrayed the younger version of Jennifer Lawrence's titular character. Lawrence, who is known for a bold energy and enthusiasm in her parts, is not an easy actor to emulate, but Isabella did it with flying colors. Because of her ability to capture Lawrence's force of nature gusto, we think Cavetti Cramp could find the magic that makes Mabel, well, Mabel. Furthermore, the young actress has quite the background, having appeared as a series regular on shows like The Neighbors and Colony, so we don't doubt she could don one of Mabel's many trademark sweaters and do her justice. Sure, she'd need to dye her hair for the role, but when you consider what some of the other actors have to do for these kinds of spooky stories, that's small potatoes. Harry Dean Stanton as Grunkle Stan Stan Pines, aka Grunkle Stan, is Dipper and Mabel's great uncle and guardian while they visit Gravity Falls for the summer. Despite his temporary parental status, viewers of the show know that Stan is not the kind of person you trust with a whole lot of anything, much less your kids. Although good at heart, Stan's got a shifting nature, and as the proprietor of the Mystery Shack, loves to utilize the local lore and paranoia to exploit tourists. However, despite his surface skepticism, we learn that Stan himself is connected to the supernatural, and knows far more about the town's real goings-on than he likes to admit. Because of his snake oil charm and paranormal leadings, we could see the part of Grunkle Stan being played by famed character actor and David Lynch alumni, Harry Dean Stanton. With a long history of playing eccentric oddballs and mysterious strangers, Stanton feels tailor-made to step into Stan's shoes. Furthermore, Stanton's roles in films like Alien, The Green Mile, and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas show us he's no stranger to elements of oddity. With these elements combined, we feel this amounts to a whole lot of what Grunkle Stan is all about. Also, since we've already seen the comparisons between Gravity Falls and Twin Peaks, Stanton not only appeared in the 1992 Twin Peaks movie, Fire Walk With Me, he is also slated to return to the universe when the show reboots on Showtime in 2017. So Stanton is an old pro when it comes to mysterious wooded towns with terrible, otherworldly secrets. Also, don't forget that Grunkle Stan has a twin brother, Stanford Pines. We could be having the double Dean Stanton for our dollar, unless... J.K. Simmons as Stanford Pines. Grunkle Stan's mysterious six-fingered twin brother, Stanford, otherwise known as The Author, is voiced on the series by Academy Award-winning actor J.K. Simmons. So why mess with something if it's not broken? Having disappeared into another dimension after having a fight with Grunkle Stan, Ford later reappears to help the mysteries of the town. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if the award-winning actor who provided the voice for Ford on the cartoon also played him in the series? So what if he's not, in actuality, the identical twin of the actor playing Grunkle Stan? It just makes it that much weirder, and weird is what Gravity Falls is about. Stephanie Scott as Wendy Corduroy. The one-time object of Dipper's affections and flaky employee of the Mystery Shack, Wendy Corduroy is a laid-back, rebellious teen who would rather have fun than responsibilities. In this part, we picture actress Stephanie Scott. While Scott's years as popular girl Lexi on Disney Channel's Ant Farm suggests she knows how to play a girl who boys pine over, it's her more recent roles on the silver screen that make us believe she has the chops to take Wendy on. More subdued than Lexi's type A attitude, Wendy is a girl who appreciates the more chill aspects of life, but also has a taste for adventure. 
Scott, who herself has butted heads with the paranormal in Insidious 3, has shown an ability to play against the Lexi type, as well as a desire to kick Ghost Butt. In addition, she already has experience bringing a cartoon character to light, having played the live-action version of Kimber in the Gem and the Holograms movie. We think Scott's ready to take to the woods and join Dipper and Mabel on their adventures. Though if we're taking the time to shout out people who've brought live-action versions of cartoons to life, we'd be remiss if we didn't take a moment to give a tip of the hat to Linda Cardellini, who voices Wendy on the cartoon. Film fans may recall that Cardellini portrayed the live-action version of Velma from Scooby-Doo in several feature films. Though Cardellini has aged out of portraying any of the characters on Gravity Falls, we like to give credit where credit is due for those who paved the way. Andy Serkis as Bill Cipher. To clarify, this isn't a role that would need to be live-action even in a live-action movie, which means getting Alex Hirsch to voice the role wouldn't be a problem. We don't disagree that this is the optimal choice, but where's the fun in optimal? We started down this path, and we're going to keep going. Maybe Alex is too busy having success making other wonderful cartoons for us. The main antagonist of Gravity Falls, Bill Cipher, is a triangular dream demon that bears more than a passing resemblance to the Illuminati symbol. Although we've seen Bill take physical form, his true, very not-human shape makes it hard to cast him with a living, breathing actor. That is, until you recall the magical work of performer Andy Serkis. Perhaps one of Hollywood's most established and iconic effects actors, Serkis has provided life to otherworldly physicalities, like Gollum in Lord of the Rings and King Kong. Serkis is all too familiar with playing characters who are more, or maybe less, than human? So why not pose him the ultimate challenge and see if he can bring life to a malevolent triangle? Circus recently portrayed the mysterious Supreme Leader Snoke in The Force Awakens, which proves he's more than just a body. He can also deliver some chilling evil, which is exactly what Bill needs to go from 2D and into the wicked third dimension. Jacob Tremblay as Lil Gideon Gideon Gleeful, known to most as Lil Gideon, is a conniving psychic and prominent antagonist to Dipper and Mabel. Impetuous and demanding, Gideon doesn't take kindly to not getting what he wants, and is prone to grandstanding. It takes a lot of presence to pull off a character like Lil Gideon, and that's why we thought of recent award season darling Jacob Tremblay for the role. Wowing audiences this year with his star-making turn in the shocking drama Room, Tremblay has been praised by critics and viewers alike for his ability to convey emotions beyond his years. Although Gravity Falls is tonally a world away from the tragic drama of Room, we can't help but wonder what it would be like if Tremblay was allowed to flex his comedic muscles as well as his dramatic ones. Gideon requires a certain amount of dramatic skill to sell his attitude, but it would take someone with a sense of humor to nail his egregious tantrums. We'd love to see an actor of Jacob Tremblay's caliber sink his teeth into this part. Plus, we're sort of curious to see what he'd look like in a little powdered wig. David Ketchner as Bud Gleeful. Lil Gideon's father, Bud Gleeful, appears friendly on the surface, but is one of Gravity Falls' most nefarious conmen. A former member of the Blind Eye Society, Bud aids and abets most of Lil Gideon's wicked schemes, as well as runs a fraudulent car dealership. As such, few could play this role better than comedian David Ketchner. Known for his work in movies such as Anchorman and as Todd Packer on The Office, Ketchner is able to affect the right mix of charm and skis needed to play someone like Bud. Furthermore, Ketchner's comedic abilities suggest he'd be the perfect comedic foil in scenes when sparring with Stan or supporting Gideon's plans. Always easygoing in presentation, but dastardly in every other way, but is the kind of character that needs someone who can twist the knife, even with a smile on their face. David Ketchner is that person. Joel Courtney is Robbie Valentino. Wendy's ex-boyfriend and low-key rival of Dippers, Rami Valentino is a teen rocker and carefree punk kid who ends up becoming a core member of the Zodiac Ring. For this part, we'd like to see Joel Courtney of Super 8 fame get a little goth. In addition to coming face to face with extraterrestrials in Super 8 and tangling with spooky things in R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour, Courtney brings the chops of being cool to the Gravity Falls universe. We can see why Dipper would be jealous of him. Plus, if you're gonna woo the girls as a lead guitarist in a band, you need someone who can believably do so. And if that possibility isn't enough to slake your thirst for Gravity Falls, here are some more ways that it could come back. A great way to get a show back in the public eye is to get more people watching it. If all of a sudden interest in Gravity Falls spikes, do you think Disney's really gonna pass up on an opportunity to make more moolah? Welcome to the Notification Squad, the show that takes people behind Channel Fred Raider, puts them in front of the camera. My name is Kate. I'm Alyssa, and hey Kate, did you know that Gravity Falls is coming back? Is that even possible? We're gonna talk all about it, and then after the discussion, Disney trivia. 
So, Kate, it's been two years since Gravity Falls ended. Wow. And that was only two seasons and 40 episodes. Yeah. That's like a nice round number. But, you know, of course, people want more. And when you compare it to other cartoons, like Adventure Time and regular show, there's mm. like around 300 episodes. That's a lot. <laughs> so then you look at Gravity Falls, there's only 40 episodes. Yeah, that's true. Of course people are going to want more. So after two years, do you think we're going to be getting more? That's the big question. Yeah, and like how? How could it be how even could, possible? What's the form? What's the form? Form. So we asked you guys, you know, do you want more episodes? Is it possible? All those sorts of things. The big comment that we got was from William Bussey. He says, the true success of a show is to end on the writer's terms when they want and still leave the fans wanting more. Gravity Falls did that. Yeah. I agree. Me too. Just based off what Alex Hirsch like wanted for the show, mm. it's supposed to be about childhood and it's supposed to be just a summer. Yeah, one summer. That one thing. So yep. even though it was two seasons and it took a while to get to that final three part yeah. finale, we didn't get it. it just rounded out really well mm -hmm. versus something like Adventure Time or some other shows that are right. just going on Regular and show. it's just being pulled like taffy. I think Adventure Time in particular does a really good job of balancing an overarching narrative and and then just standalone episodes. Yes. I think they do a really good job on that. So I'm really excited to see what happens with the final season. Um, but Gravity Falls and Steven Universe, actually, I think mm -hmm. they're not so isolated. You know, they are standalone events, but really every episode ties in together. Yes. You know, I understand that 40 episodes, it's, it's easier to tell a story about that one summer. Basically. However, mm -hmm. if it did come back, uh, what would we want to see happen, you know? I kind of want like a mini series. Mm. Like they've done like shorts yes, before, like and Seuss. even yeah, <laughs> even after it ended, they did some sort of shorts on like the Disney XD YouTube channel, right. I think. So I would love just little mini series of like Dipper and Maple's adventures, okay. something like that. You wouldn't want another, yeah, like I wouldn't episodes. want yeah, I wouldn't want a continuation of what happened. Mm -hmm. I would want just more adventure. Okay, I yeah. guess. And it would be you know weird I mean? to just yeah, I mean, go back to the same summer. Yeah, I don't think that makes sense. No. I'm with you, but I think like a movie. It would be cool if it's like right when they get off the bus, uh, you know, when they get back home, yeah, and it's just like that first hour. You know, like when you come back from the summer break in like elementary school or like middle school, and mm -hmm. they're like, okay, let's go around the room and talk about. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> how your summer was. And then Dipper and Mabel are like, here's good. what happened, and oh, no one man. believes them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so we asked you guys as well, and Daz184 says they should do a prequel. I oh. Think, I think that would be kind of interesting. Wait, what does that mean? Like, if you're talking about a prequel, I would want Little Ford and Little Stan. Oh, so not even Mabel Dipper prequel. No, I want right. like their yeah, adventures. We saw a little bit of that. I think a prequel would be pretty cool. Um, I would be on board for that. Again, just something that's not going back to what we've already had. You know, yeah. I think it'd really have to be yeah, something Yeah, we need different. something new. Yeah, and for fresh. sure, for sure. Sagely Demonologist says, remember what Dipper said, he refuses to miss out on Mabel's awkward teen years. So maybe a sequel. So maybe in their teen years, Ooh. maybe age them up a little bit. I, I mean, like that. look, it happened in Naruto. If Naruto <laughs> can do it, I want a spinoff just called Seuss. And it's all about Seuss. Oh, it's just Seuss's <laughs> adventure is like being in charge of the Mr. Jack. Exactly. There you go. And then lastly, an idea that we had was a live action movie. I would love that. I but, wouldn't even know where to begin. But I want it to be like really funny mm -hmm. and kind of stupid where it's like Jason Ritter and Kristen Schaal, who are the voices mm -hmm. of Dipper and Mabel, uh -huh. play Dipper and Mabel. Mm -hmm. But like as kids, right? But but they're adults. It'd be interesting. Like I want all the original voice actors to come back, mm. and I want Alex Hirsch to play all of his parts. Ooh. But he's just Alex Hirsch. But those are the ways that we think Gravity Falls should come back, and we want to know yours. So leave them in the comments below. But enough about Gravity Falls. Let's get on to Disney trivia. Let's do it. Welcome to Factor Fiction, the only trivia show that says, "Was he wearing that earlier?" We got new guests here. We are so happy to have you. John, my favorite intern, joining us. Thanks. I know. How's it going? <laughs> Casey, the queen of earrings, right in the middle. And back for redemption, Dan. Yo. <laughs> Yo. Uh, today we're playing for Jolly Rancher Cinnamon, the worst flavor ever, but we have a giant bag of it in the office. So that's what we're playing for today. So I think a little bit better than pennies. The first segment we've got is, of course, fact or fiction. It's very straightforward. It's basically true or false. You know, you just put up the flag if it's fact, you put up the flag if it's fiction. All right, everyone ready? Ready. Questions? Okay, good. Here we go. Number one. Finn once used a very long Q-tip as a weapon in Adventure Time. He owns 25 swords, so I'm not sure. What do you guys think? Fact. Fact. We've got three Little facts, fact. and that was fiction, guys. Wow. Ooh. Never Ooh. used a Q-tip. Transformers can change into a ton of things, so it's no surprise that one Transformer toy even turned into a working mouse. Like a computer mouse? Like a computer mouse. <laughs> you think it's a real mouse? Let's reveal in three, two, one. Well, we got three fictions? 
That was a fact. Oh my god! I know that's you can actually you that's can that's buy the that's mouse that's on that's Amazon that's right now. Who it's, uses a mouse anymore? It's seventy five dollars. That's, I don't that's know. ridiculous. I, I'm mouse. sorry. I'm sorry. The Magic School Bus covered quite a few subjects in its time. One of the episodes even featured Miss Frizzle teaching the class about skin puncturing vampires. Is this like Twilight vampires? <laughs> it's Magic School Bus. It was like the nineties. Right, let's reveal in three, two, one. All right, it was actually a fact. Hey. Yeah, so finally, so we got some points on the board. John in the lead with one point. The regular show staff is full of anime lovers as seen when they opened an episode with a recreation of the Dragon Ball Z theme song. Let's reveal in three, two, one. All right, we've got fact, fiction, fact, and it was actually fiction. It was Neon Genesis Evangelion, actually. It was not the DBZ theme. So that one, you know, that's tricky. You just had to know which anime it was. Bill Cyber from Gravity Falls actually held an AMA on Reddit. Fact or fiction? He's a fictional character. I'll give you a hint there. All right, let's reveal in three, two, one. Fact. Three facts, and that is correct. Oh, Everyone nice. Everyone gets a point. Dan's on the board with one. Casey's got two, and John's got two as well. Gotta take you out, John. All right, Next we'll round. Keep on sucking. <laughs> it's the Jolly Rancher slogan, so. The next section is fill in the blank. It's pretty uh, pretty straightforward. I'm gonna read a sentence or two, and then you have to fill in the blanks accordingly. There could be one blank, two blanks, three blanks. For each blank you get correct, you get a point. So keep that in mind. All right, everyone ready? A very early song in the 1998 Disney movie, Blank, claimed it would make a blank out of you. Keep in mind, this is all Disney theme trivia on the second section. All right, so let's reveal. What do we got? Mulan is correct, Mulan and Man is correct, and Mulan and Man is correct. So John's gonna go ahead and get one point. Oops, sorry. I forgot the second <laughs> blank. <laughs> Casey, mistake. you're gonna get two, give one to John, don't mind. And then Dan nailed it with the two. Good job, Dan. Yeah. Uh, who could forget the iconic logo by the Toy Story Studio, blank, featuring a jumping blank. You got this, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> really throwing him some softballs here. <laughs> All right, let's see, what do we got? Pixar, lamp. Pixar and lamp, yeah. I actually didn't. Well, I guess I didn't... bonus points for drawing the lamp. Sure. Well, yes. I drew what? the lamp. Oh, I made, he did too. I made a smiley face. Yours That's why we're doing bad, it. <laughs> That's why we're doing hey, it. Nobody did the ball, though. That's true. If you yeah. did the ball, I can maybe give you two. So we're gonna give three to Dan. What? Only two to Casey. I'm sorry, and three to John. They, they drew the lamp. Uh, I'm so. It, creativity I'm points so... was your idea. <laughs> okay. It's on. A couple questions remaining. The board is tied with six Jolly Ranchers each. All right. Next question. Gravity Falls resident grifter Blank is Dipper and Mabel's guardian for the summer. They endearingly call him their Blank. Let's reveal, what do we got? All right, so we've got cool guy Stan and Juanita. Uh, Stan is correct, it is their uncle Stan. And we've got friend Grunkle and pet ostrich. They do not call him pet ostrich, they do call him Grunkle. Which puts Casey ahead by two Jolly Ranchers, yeah. Grunkle and Stan. And I, I drew a picture too. <laughs> I'm tempted. <laughs> It's a good one. He's wearing fine, a hat. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. <laughs> I think you should take one point away from her because she's spelled asking? Grunkle wrong. No, right. I spelled Ooh. it right. Is it with a C? Um, oh, with a K. It's so with a K. All right, you can have my hat um, point everybody back. Knows take that. it. <laughs> take Ju it. Judges say spelling counts, so. Adrian, <laughs> I know where you sit. Final question for this round, and it has three blanks in it. So, you know, everyone has a chance here, okay? In 2017, Disney rebooted this classic 1990s show, Blank. It featured all sorts of new talent, like Blank as Scrooge McDuck, and Hamilton star Blank as Gizmo Duck. What do we got? Uh, everyone got DuckTales correct. Uh, David Tennant is correct. It is not Cher. Why'd you put Cher for Scrooge McDuck? Because <laughs> she'd make a brilliant Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> you really would. Um, and Triple H, the wrestler, is not Scrooge McDuck. And then we've got Lin-Manuel Miranda, Alexander Hamilton, no, and Lin-Manuel Ham Hamilton, dude, yes. So you get two points. Casey, unfortunately, you're only getting one. And John, you're also getting two as well. That's the I'm job. Give bonus points for Alexander Hamilton. This was three points. Okay. So only three points. Right? Thank you, Dick. Wait, wait, wait. I got that? the joke. Oh, you got the duck got diving a, in. Duck All right, that's fair. That's fair. All right, so you, you both nice. get them. You both get them. Uh, I think one oh, of those wait. was yours. No, one of those was yours. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so the final round is a drawing challenge. So I'm going to give you a prompt, and then you're basically going to draw it, and then I'm going to pick someone, and they're going to get three Jolly Ranchers, which will pretty much determine the winner this Ooh. week. I have faith in you, Dan. You can come back and take the crown. All right, so you're going to have one minute on the clock. Is everyone ready? Got your drawing hands ready and everything? Yes. Okay. I want you guys to draw Hot Olaf. Oh. Your time starts now. Hot Olaf. You know, we see him, you know, a couple times, you know, in Frozen. 
He was in that 30 minute special that uh, aired before Coco, everyone was a super fan of. Um, you know, I wanna see some hot Olaf. All right, time's almost up. Three, two, one. Time is up, pin down. Pin down. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start with John. Let's, let's see what you have. Hot Olaf. Behold the masterpiece. <laughs> oh. In summer, All right, okay. All right, so I see his nose, his eyes, and he's sad. Okay, Casey, what do you got? Boom. He's got muscles, he's emotionally available, and he has health insurance. Ooh. Whoa. Hot Olaf. Oh, piece of oh that. my God. Swipe right immediately. <laughs> Super like, all those things. I really, really Maybe like it. No, so cheating, <laughs> cheating. <laughs> all right, Dan, what do you got? Um, yeah. So this is my Hot Olaf. Similar idea to John here. I forgot the carrot, but I just added it. So mm -hmm. that's totally cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun's out. High temperature. Uh -huh. Well, it actually, looks like maybe about 80 That's degrees. That's a yeah. thermometer. Wow. The cold never, never bothered him. Anyway. anyway. Uh, oh man, this one is really, really hard. Um, Swipe right. Oh, I have to give it to Casey. Oh. He has health insurance. I'm oh. sorry, Dan. Winner this week goes to Casey. Good job. Thanks, Hot Olaf. <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching Fact or Fiction. Dan, unfortunately, you lost again. I was really hoping we could bring you back for redemption, but I, I guess lost by this <laughs> you now. were very close. You were Literally. very close. I know. You you did really good this time. I think we'll bring you back next time, right. and you'll have another chance at redemption. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. We're really curious. How many did you get right? Did you get all of them right? Did you get some of them right? Let us know in the comments below. Here's a gem from Days Gone By. It's a whole video outlining the show for new watchers. What is Gravity Falls? Hey there, I don't really have time to talk. I need to head over to Gravity Falls fast. Something strange is going on over there and I have to find out what it is. Wait, you haven't heard of what Gravity Falls is? So does that mean you don't know who Bill is? Well, I have time to tell you about this tale. I'm Alyssa with Channel Frederator and I'm here to break down why you should be watching Gravity Falls on this episode of Know Your Show. Let's get started. Dipper and Mabel Pines are sent to stay the summer with their great uncle Stan in Gravity Falls, Oregon. After finding a mysterious journal in the woods, the Pines twins discover that this isn't just a normal town. It's paranormal. From 2012 to 2016, we discovered the weirdness of Gravity Falls through 40 episodes and two seasons. During its run, the series aired on Disney Channel and Disney XD. So why is Gravity Falls worth checking out? Well, have you ever played a game or read through a book and found yourself discovering the mystery before it was revealed? Doesn't that feel great? Gravity Falls is similar and it makes the viewer feel like a detective. Each episode has a secret code hidden in it and there's a specific cipher used to solve those codes. Even if you aren't into mysteries, you'll still wanna dig into the secrets of the show. And don't get me started on the image that we see flash on the screen right after the title sequence. That's a mystery that you'll wanna find out on your own. The cast of characters on the show are unique in their own ways. Dipper Pines is an adventurer. He can never sit still, and he's always looking for clues so he can figure out what is really going on in Gravity Falls. If I told you that he's actually 12 years old, you wouldn't believe me. Well, I guess his height kind of gives it away, but not his brains. Sometimes he's too perceptive. So it's great that his sister Mabel is there to help him out when need be. Mabel Pines is lovable, quirky, energetic, optimistic, and a lot of other characteristics that just describe someone who's having a fun time. She wears a different colorful knitted sweater every day, and she is super skilled in arts and crafts. Check it out, Dipper! I successfully bazazzled my face! Blink! Ow! She's also a bit boy crazy, and the boys that she's liked have been a bit crazy themselves. Mabel is five minutes older than Dipper, and although she sometimes acts more like a child, she's always there for her brother to balance him out with her silliness. Stan Pines, or as the Pines twins call him, Grunkle Stan, is characterized as selfish, greedy, and a con artist. He runs and lives in the Mystery Shack, a tourist attraction in Gravity Falls that shows the bizarre creatures that are known as legends in the town. He loves money so much that he's known to have gotten some of it illegally. It is revealed throughout the series that Stan has a secret past, but we don't want to spoil that for you. Although he doesn't sound like the best caretaker, he really does care for his great niece and nephew. Now who wants to put on some blindfolds and get into my car? Yay! Wait, what? Some other characters that we should mention, Seuss is the handyman of the Mystery Shack. He's close friends with the twins and loves to tag along with them on their mystery adventures. Seuss is literally described as a man-child who wants to be where the action is. He someday wants to follow the footsteps of Stan because he sees him as a father figure. Wendy is the coolest person ever. She works as a part-time employee at the Mystery Shack. 
She's super mellow, tomboyish, and is the local lumberjack's only daughter. Dipper has a huge crush on her, and every time he tries to impress her, he fails. Gideon Gleeful, aka Little Gideon. So much to say about this vicious little pumpkin of a child. He became the nemesis of the Pines family after Mabel denied his love. He also owned an amulet that gave him telekinetic powers, but Mabel destroyed it after he attempted to kill Dipper. He also hates Stan because the Mystery Shack is a competitor of his. Gideon is in possession of Journal 2, the previous volume to the journal that Dipper found in the woods. Now, here is the biggest threat of Gravity Falls. I can't even speak his name. He might be listening right now. But you want to know about him. Bill Cipher is a demon that can be released into our reality, even our minds. He wishes to stop the Pines twins from discovering any secrets of Gravity Falls, because they will ruin his diabolical plan of taking over our dimension. So never shake his hand, because if you do, he will become your worst nightmare. Trust no one. Well, now that we got that out of the way, let's move on to the next part. Here's some quotes that every Gravity Falls fan should know. Every time Sue says, Dodes. Future is in the past. Onward, Iyoshima! When there's no cops around, anything's legal. Reality's an illusion, the universe is a hologram. Bye, gold, bye! Shmabulok. The whole series of Gravity Falls holds many adventures. The best of them include tons of gnomes, time traveling, an adorable pig, Larry King wax figure, dinosaurs coming out of peanut brittle, shape-shifting beings, burning sock puppets, a secret society, time baby, taxidermies coming to life, a bottomless pit, and a whole lot more weird. But with all of this weird stuff, I bet you're wondering how Gravity Falls came to be. Well, Gravity Falls was created by Alex Hirsch, who worked as a writer and a story word artist on Cartoon Network's The Misadventures of Flapjack. If this isn't an indication of the weirdness to come, I don't know what is. He pitched Gravity Falls to Disney while he co-developed their other animated series, Fish Hooks. Hirsch can relate to the Pines twins really well because he's a twin himself. Actually, his twin sister, Ariel, is the inspiration for Mabel. They both wore knitted sweaters and they both love pigs. Hirsch also provides the voices for Grunkle Stan, Old Man McGucket, and Bill Cipher. Mabel is voiced by Kristen Schaal, who also voices Louise on Bob's Burgers. Now, people believe that Gravity Falls only had two seasons and edited so fast because Disney actually canceled it. That is incorrect. Alex Hirsch stated that it was his decision to end the show after two seasons. This is because he didn't want Dipper and Mabel Summer to go on forever. He wanted a full story and he wanted it to be completed properly. This doesn't mean that we won't see Gravity Falls again. It just means that this chapter is over and the next one will be somewhere in the future. And we really hope the series does come back because it was a hit. They have awards to prove it too. It won two Primetime Emmy Awards and three Annie Awards. There are a lot of reasons why people really love the show. But what got me into it was the relationship between Dipper and Mabel. Their bond is so strong. They are two halves of a whole person. And as the series continues, that bond of theirs gets tested. So be prepared for it because I sure wasn't. The pilot is the best place to start because it introduces the characters and gets you right into the adventure. It really helps you dip your toe into the mystery. One of the best episodes has to be the inconveniencing. Dipper tries to act really cool around Wendy and he and Mabel end up getting invited by the teenagers to go to a haunted convenience store. The two highlights of the episode are Mabel's hallucinations after eating Smile Dip. How many of these did you eat? 11. Teen. And Dipper dancing in a lamb costume. Hey, I did say this show was weird. Don't give me that look. Other episodes that show the overall mystery of Gravity Falls are Dreamscaperers, Season 1, Episode 19, Into the Bunker, Season 2, Episode 22, Sock Opera, Season 2, Episode 24, Society of the Blind Eye, Season 2, Episode 27, Northwest Mansion Mystery, Season 2, Episode 30, Not What He Seems, Season 2, Episode 31, A Tale of Two Stands, Season 2, Episode 32, Dipper and Mabel vs. The Future, Season 2, Episode 37, and Weird Mageddon Part 1, 2, and 3, Season 2, Episodes 38 through 40. A final reason for checking out Gravity Falls is the overall theme of growing up. This is Dipper and Mabel's last summer of being a kid, and they have to go to high school when they head back home. We learn, even the adult viewers, that it's okay to grow up and to still have your imagination. Whoa, that got real deep real fast. <laughs> Gravity Falls ended on February 15th, 2016, but you can still find episodes of it on Disney XD's website. You can also find the series on streaming sites like Hulu, YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play. So now you know your show. That's pretty much the basics of Gravity Falls. I hope you can catch up soon so you can help me find out what is really going on there. And watch out, Bill Cipher could be around any corner.
Gravity Falls is a unique and creative piece of media unto itself, but nothing exists in a vacuum. Of course, plenty of movies, video games, and more have influenced the creators and the rest of the team behind the show. Sometimes these references can be pretty hard to pick out, so we did all the heavy lifting for you. Our next video is Gravity Falls references to movies, video games, and more. Come into the Mystery Shack and check out our map of references? Yep, join us today as we venture and dissect the mythological locale of Oregon. More specifically, the pop culture references found in the hilarious episodes of Gravity Falls. Hi, I'm Alyssa with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to check out some of the fun homages paid by Mabel, Dipper, and the whole gang. So get that journal out and get ready to crack some of these mysteries. A Clockwork Orange In Season 1, Episode 6, Dipper vs. Manliness, Dipper spends the whole episode trying to become a real man and eventually runs into Manotars. Manly Minotars, if the name isn't evidence enough, while exploring the forest in Gravity Falls. During a montage with these Manotars, Dipper's eyes are held open while he's pinned down, and he's made to focus on the glory and honor inspiration posters in order to ingrain manliness into his mind. This is a reference to the Ludovico Technique, which was a type of aversion therapy from the book and movie A Clockwork Orange. Where I come from, it's called laser eye surgery. Tape Man. This reference can be seen in episodes 14 and 17 of season 1, Bottomless Pit, and Boys Crazy. Dipper uses a tape recorder with the words Tape Man written across it. This is an allusion to the very popular Sony Walkman, which was a portable audio cassette player. Viewers born during and after the 90s may have never seen one of these devices in person, but I promise it existed. And kudos to Gravity Falls to bringing it back. Video game references. Gravity Falls has referenced many video games throughout the series. We've seen Dance Dance Revolution in the form of Dancy Pants Revolution in The Inconveniencing, season one, episode five, when Thompson is playing the game, but is transported by ghosts just as he was attaining a high score. The arrows on the screen may seem fine while you play, but Thompson experienced how pointed they are firsthand. During The Time Traveler's Pig, which itself is an allusion to the novel The Time Traveler's Wife, Dibber and Mabel meet Fertilia and Grady Mech who are traveling the Oregon Trail with their six children. Their surname is a reference to MECC, which is an acronym for the Minnesota Educational Computing Consortium, who produced the video game The Oregon Trail. Fight Fighters, the 10th episode of the first season, references Street Fighter and other video games throughout the episode. After using a code he found that promised to unleash ultimate power, Dipper allows Rumble, a character in the Fight Fighters game, to come alive. Rumble will go on to use a half-eaten taco as a power-up, a reference to random food being a power-up in video games, and eventually go out of control attacking Robbie. During this attack, he throws barrels at Robbie in the style of the classic Donkey Kong. The cryptogram at the end of the episode when decoded reads, Sorry Dipper, your Wendy is in another castle. Referencing the classic line Toad tells Mario and Super Mario Brothers. Some fans debate whether the episode Seuss and the Real Girl has a reference to Five Nights at Freddy's. There are some animatronics and a pizzeria in the episode, which is clearly a reference to Chuck E. Cheese, which is spoofed by Five Nights at Freddy's, so double reference? However, the game came out after this episode aired, so many believe that it's just a Chuck E. Cheese reference. What do you think? That same episode references popular Japanese dating sims in general, with a game called Romance Academy 7. This game is a Japanese dating simulator created by the fictitious company No Life Games and sold at Beeply Boobs Video Games store, which is where Seuss purchased it and the madness with Giffney begins. Disney References Gravity Falls was developed and aired on the Disney Channel and Disney XD, so it makes sense that Disney references are scattered throughout the show. If you thought the scene of Mabel and Waddles eating the same slice of pizza from different ends looks familiar, that's because it directly references Lady and the Tramp, the Disney movie where the famous canine characters eat the same strand of spaghetti and end up kissing, or technically nose nuzzling in the case of dogs. Another Disney reference is seen as a result of Gideon's narcissism during the episode Gideon Rises, which shows a theoretical theme park named Gideon Land. This is an allusion to Disneyland in both concept and logo. In addition, both Disney and Gravity Falls convey the warning that pigs, such as waddles, should always be wary of predatory flying animals. In the episode Land Before Swine, which is a spoof of the movie title The Land Before Time, waddles is picked up by a pterodactyl and flown away. Besides the similarity of featuring dinosaurs, like The Land Before Time did, this is also similar to a scene in The Black Cauldron, a Disney movie where Tarin, the main character who is a pig keeper, has his pig scooped up by a dragon. Hide your pigs, hide your wife! Twin Peaks Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch loves the show Twin Peaks, and so naturally he included references to it in his own work. Both shows take place in a similar Pacific Northwest location and have supernatural aspects. During the Gravity Falls episode The Hand That Rocks the Maple, we're shown a room called The Club Club, which is a reference to the Red Room in the Black and White Lounge from Twin Peaks. The Club Club is decorated in the same fashion as the Red Room, down to the pattern of the floor. Hirsch has said that it was meant to look like a David Lynch nightmare. I think it's safe to say he succeeded. Now let me go turn my nightlight on. Loch Ness Monster 
Speaking of scary, you may have recognized the monster who made an appearance in Season 1, Episode 2. In The Legend of the Gobblewonker, Old Man McGucka claims to have seen a monster in the water with a long neck like a giraffe and wrinkled skin like Grunkle Stan. Sound familiar? That's because the Gobblewonker is a reference to the Loch Ness Monster. Dipper and Mabel go on a mission to snap a picture of it and win a contest, but instead they find out that the monster they were chasing was actually a robot created by Old Man McGucket to get attention. Just like the real Loch Ness Monster, however, the real Gobblewonker is still lurking beneath the waters of Lake Gravity Falls. Movie references. Gurry Falls isn't afraid to reference movies of any genre, as evidenced with the previous A Clockwork Orange reference. During the Dreamscaperers episode, Dipper uses an incantation to transport them all into Stan's mind. A part of the incantation is Inceptus Nolanus Overatus, which is broken Latin for Nolan's Inception is Overrated. We're not surprised that Dipper has strong feelings about the movie Inception, as most people do. And the top was definitely spinning at the end. This is a movie and music reference in one. In season one, episode 16, Carpet Diem, Mabel is shown asleep with a DVD box on her face and a disc in her hand. The movie is titled Boy's World, with a boy band on the cover. This is referencing the 1997 film Spice World, which featured the Spice Girls. You know, that English pop group that was pretty much the biggest girl group of all time? Yeah. Them. Miyazaki movies have a far-reaching influence on animated series, and Gravity Falls is included on that list. This is evidenced by the Summerween trickster during the episode appropriately titled Summerween. When the trickster shifts from its first form to its second, it wears a small mask similar to No Face's mask and spirited away. Guess masks are more recognizable than faces. In Season 2, Episode 6, the Mystery Shack is loaded with movie and TV references beginning with the episode title, The Little Gift Shop of Horrors, referencing the classic film, The Little Shop of Horrors. Lord of the Rings fans will recognize a palantir displaying the Eye of Sauron in the store. There's a VHS copy of a movie called Honey, I Shrunk a Ghost, referencing the movie Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, a King Kong gorilla model, and even a chair that's modeled after the one, the Iron Throne, in Game of Thrones. Phew, that's a lot rolled into one. Let's not forget the movie reference in The Legend of Gombolwonker, when Dipper has a fantasy where he's being interviewed about his picture of the Gombolwonker. In the fantasy, not only is he dressed similar to Indiana Jones, but ends up with Mabel busting in with a giant circular bubble that she is in, boulder anyone, and chasing Dipper and the host with her rolling pink bubble boulder. Hey, at least that's not Deadly, another dangerous shout out, in the episode Headhunters, Mabel swings an axe while making the famous, scary, raised knife sound from the movie Psycho. <laughs> it actually sounds adorable when she does it. There's even a little sci-fi shout-out thrown into Gravity Falls. While Dipper has his hands full during Fight Fighters, Seuss is playing an arcade game titled Nort. Nort is the backward spelling of the classic sci-fi movie, Tron, where the main character ends up inside of a video game and has to escape. Seuss attempts to ENTER the game, but ends up inside of the arcade machine itself. Whoops. Music. If you thought some of the music in the show seemed familiar, you were right. The characters often reprise famous songs with their own personal touch, of course. In Double Dipper, Mabel sings her song, Don't Start Unbelieving, which, if you can't tell from the title, alludes to the famous Journey song, Don't Stop Believing. In Dipper vs. Manliness, the pop group Baba sings their song, Disco Girl. You may have recognized this as a reference to the real-life group Abba's song, Dancing Queen, which appears in the musical Mamma Mia. When Mabel's favorite band, several times, comes to Gravity Falls, you may have noticed some real-life inspiration for this band as well. Their song Cray Cray clearly resembles the instant hit Bye Bye Bye. Can you blame them? That song still rules. Dancing. Iconic dance scenes are a staple in pop culture, so it's no surprise that a few have found their way into Gravity Falls. Did you recognize Michael Jackson's moonwalk when the tall man that Dipper calls Stretch did it in the Double Dipper? Also in Land Before Swine, Mabel may have got her inspiration for the pig dance party routine from The Breakfast Club because she uses some of the moves from the dancing montage. Like we all haven't done that before? No? Just me? Okay. Jersey! We can't leave out the awesome references to New Jersey. In the episode A Tale of Two Stans, we found out that Stan and his twin brother are from Glass Shard Beach, New Jersey. That's one. In the flashback, we see the family pawn shop, which is called Pine Ponds. That's two. Because the Pines is a forest area that covers seven counties of New Jersey, famous for being where the New Jersey Devils live. Okay, and also that's their last name, so duh. We also see young Stanley and Sanford dragging a boat that they found across the beach, while chanting, that's three. Then they grow up and Stanford wins a science fair. The New Jersey Science Fair to be exact. Ding! That's four. The principal suggests that Stanley will probably stay in New Jersey forever. That's five. Okay, uh, I'll calm down with these references. They also show a beach that looks similar to Jersey Shore with a dock full of rides and Stanley remembers that he eventually got banned from New Jersey. Six, seven. Ah, uh, lucky seven. And to finish off our marathon, we decided to really pick apart the episode Fight Fighters, one particularly jam-packed with Easter eggs and references. Consider this your guide. Hi everyone, I'm Arielle and this is Cartoon Balloon, where we rewind our favorite series to find those hidden gems and fascinating facts. <laughs> 
This exact shot of the arcade popped up in the last episode, The Time Traveler's Pig, where Blendon Blendon's camo suit malfunctions. He's really ahead of his time. Check out the arcade machine on the right side of the screen here. There's Bill Cipher, nine episodes before his official debut. You may notice that Bill is green here. That isn't just bad arcade graphics. The character designers originally colored him that way until somebody said he looked like a leaf. The games here are spoofs of real franchises. Frog Time is a play on Frogger, and Nerd Punch 2 is like Punch-Out, but uh, meaner. Well, my house was haunted, I'll learn how to eat ghosts. Ghost Maze is a reference to the Pac-Man series. Not sure of what Haunting Seuss is referencing though, or what category of ghost can be eaten. Consult the journal! Hoedown Hero is based on games like Dance Dance Revolution, with some Guitar Hero thrown in. Since it's out of order, it must not be popular, just like the real Guitar Hero. BG Painter Extreme is a gag from the background artists, who did an extreme job painting in all these inside jokes. Fight Fighters' main inspiration was Street Fighter 2, the game that's credited with revitalizing the arcade machine industry and popularizing two-person local multiplayer. Dr. Karate may be related to Mr. Karate, the alter ego of Takuma Sakazaki from the SNK fighting games. This guy got his PhD though, so he's the family favorite. The pixel art in this episode was made by Paul Robertson, a veteran pixel artist. His portfolio includes Fez and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World the Game. Storyboard artist Matt Braley knew Robertson and got him the job. It was a good match too. The crew would gather around and freak out about his artwork when it came in. The concept art of this fight fighter's background had a dinosaur in place of the Maniki Neko. Must have gone extinct during the production. It isn't revealed until the Love God, but the V in Robbie's name stands for Valentino. Not as macabre as we would have hoped. Weirdly, we never see the tombstones on the show, but seeing as how the Valentinos run a funeral home, it makes you wonder if Robbie plays with actual tombstones. Notice here that Robbie is holding his poster with three fingers and a thumb. But on the poster, he has five. Unfortunately, despite all the time foolery in the last episode, The Time Traveler's Pig, Robbie and Wendy are still in a relationship in this episode. The Mystery Shack is filled with H emblazoned decor. They're short for Hirsch, as in Alex Hirsch, the show's creator. Mabel thinks they're playing Go Fish, but this looks more like Texas Hold'em, and her two kings would be called Cowboys or King Kong. This is the first appearance of Chip Hackers, the chip-flavored crackers. In future episodes, you can read the text at the bottom of the box, not for human consumption. Chip Hackers manufacturer Nyums is behind a bunch of other food items on the show, like Smile Dip, Gummy Koalas, Burrito Bites, and Niam Should I stick waddles on them again? <laughs> Mabel's offer to stick waddles on Robbie is a nod to the last episode, The Time Traveler's Pig. This pig's already worth his weight in gold. Seuss's cousin Reggie, who got killed by a teenager or something, finally appears in the flesh in Seuss and the Real Girl. His arms and legs seem to have healed up just fine. The Laser Wizard pinball game could be a nod to the song Pinball Wizard by The Who, which appeared in the rock opera Tommy. The Whirl brand TV set is named after Ian Whirl, the show's art director. The taxidermy jackalope that Stan is gluing together actually broke back and tourist trapped. Guess he finally got the time to fake, I mean, fix it. <laughs> Mabel's four leaf clover sweater reappears in Sock Opera in the short Mabel's Guide to Fashion. Must be a lucky one. Stan's distrust of ladders explains the secret ladder to the roof from the inconveniencing. It wasn't the roof that was off limits, it was that dangerous ladder. <laughs> Here's another one of those H's on the stained glass fixture. Alex Hirsch actually had that exact, um, whatever that is hanging in his office. Although on the real sign, the H stands for Ham's beer. The collectible light up sign also plays ambient forest sounds. Acrophobia or fear of heights is one of the most common fears out there. Ironic that Stan who runs a museum of oddities is afraid of something so basic. We've got a few new arcade games here. Back Bar, a Burger Time homage called Pizza Time, and a crane game called The Claw, just like in Toy Story. Nord is based on a game, based on a movie, based on a game, Tron. It's even got the same name, just backward. Zeus's thought about going inside the game for real is literally the plot of the movie Tron. Unlike him, they don't, um, literally go inside the game. 
Look closely. When Dipper deselected B-Store, his icon disappears right off South America. Look at the detail on the character select screen. We've got Rumble McSkirmish, Sajessica, Zarbarian, B-Store, Joe Zambique, and Buffalo, Admiral Big Cavs, and Dr. Karate. Several names are punny plays on Street Fighter characters. B-Store is a twist on Blanca, and Buffalo is based on M. Bison, and Joe Zambique is from Mozambique. Sajessica looks just like Chun-Li, and her name mocks the sexualization of women in fighting games. Dr. Karate's wardrobe is based on the Street Fighter villain M. Bison. His wacky hairstyle, though, is pulled straight from Guile. This code is different from what Dipper says to himself moments later, so either the crew goofed or Dipper got it wrong, which would explain his lack of ultimate power. According to journal number three, Rumble's full name is Rumble Fracas Melee Fist Cuff Slap Fight Excurbish, from the USA. Rumble is voiced by Brian Bloom, who has a history of video game voice acting. His most recognizable role is William B.J. Blaskovich from the Wolfenstein series. Change machine, change me into a powerful wolf! Rumble's powerful wolf line is a reference to Altered Beast. It's another side-scrolling fighting game in which the player gets changed into, well, a powerful wolf. This gamer previously appeared in The Legend of the Gobblewonker and Irrational Treasure, carrying glass panels, and both times had them destroyed. Whoops. Happy Great Uncle's Day! Huh? Is it Great Uncle's Day? There is, actually. National Aunt and Uncle Day is July 26th. We're sure you can celebrate your granties and grunkles on that day, too. That freaky concoction in the fridge is maple juice. Stan calls it if coffee and nightmares had a baby. And that seems about right from the look of it. Well, we don't have any traditional power-ups. Turkey legs, pizza boxes, or gold rings. All the power-ups Dipper mentions are from other games. Turkey legs are from Castlevania and Final Fight. Pizza boxes are from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games. The gold rings are from Sonic the Hedgehog. Gotta go fast. Take me to the Soviet Union! History lesson. The Soviet Union was a socialist state in present-day Russia from 1922 to 1991. Like Street Fighter and Final Fight, Fight Fighters must have come out in the late 1980s before it dissolved. That being said, Sarbarian's flag in Fight Fighters is actually the flag of present-day Russia, so Rumble Soviet Union comment makes no sense after all. The statue in Town Square depicts Nathaniel Northwest, the founder of Gravity Falls. It first appeared in Irrational Treasure. In Final Fight, you can obtain a pipe from destroying an oil drum or a crate. The sword that Rumble finds later is a reference to weapons inside scrolling beat-em-ups. Pit Cola, a popular beverage in Gravity Falls, is a peach-flavored soda. Also, it has real peach pits inside of it. Nutritious! The drink is named after Joe Pitt, one of the artists of the show. Watch Mabel's headband and skirt when she switches sweaters here. They change colors to match the new outfit. Hey, eye patch. what did the kid promise you? More tape for your forearms? <laughs> Both the eye patch and the taped forearms that Robbie alludes to here are references to Sagat, another Street Fighter character that Rumble is based on. Rumble's animation for charging up his fireball attack is the same as the way Ryu charges his Hadouken. This ravaged street, Parpa Road, is named after background painter Josh Parpin. This very specific retailer, Barrels and Crates, is a nod to the furniture store, Crate and Barrel. This sequence is a parody to the arcade classic Donkey Kong, right down to the layout of the awnings. Rumble is playing the role of DK, while Robbie is Mario himself. The store in the background, Eric's Fountain Drinks, is a play on the episode storyboard artist, Eric Fountain. The go arrow here is a staple of beat-em-up fighting games like Streets of Rage and Golden Axe. Destroy everything, then move along. The rich kid here is a cameo role by none other than Spy Kids legend Daryl Sabara. There's an identical bonus route to this in Final Fight where the player smashes up a car, right down to the owner coming out at the end and lamenting, oh, my car. This rich father and son reappear in Northwest Mansion Mystery, attending Preston and Priscilla's fancy party. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. All you can eat! Rumble's syllabic emphasis on all you can eat is similar to the way Ryu pronounces Shoryuken, his iconic uppercut move. 
free pizza guy can't catch a break. You didn't get any pizza at the Wax Museum opening in Headhunters, missed out on Sloppy Toss in Time Traveler's Pig, and now this. Fun fact, apparently Alex Hirsch and the crew knew about all the fanfics of Free Pizza Guy online and used to read them together for kicks. <laughs> This is the first time we ever see Seuss's pickup truck, which comes back numerous times throughout the series. Robbie's explosion muffin graffiti from the inconveniencing reappears on the back of the water tower. There's another one on the fence, just down below. Though it's not visible here, Seuss's license plate reads Fixin' It 1. It's a reference to a short series, Fixin' It with Seuss. Finish him is the iconic callout from Mortal Kombat, just before the character uses their often graphic fatality move. Rumble claims that he doesn't have a looking up animation, but we've clearly seen him look up a few times in this episode, like when he shouted Riboflavin. The Chinese character on Rumble's back translates to part. Rumble McSkirmish returns! He cameos in the season 2 episode, Seuss and the Real Girl, as well as coming back for the three-part series finale. These days, Rumble's doing well for himself. After Seuss and the Real Girl, Jiffany was zapped into the Fight Fighters game, and the two have been together ever since. We need to make a Cold War Pact. Okay, what's that? History lesson number two. Dipper and Robbie's Cold War Pact is an allusion to the conflict between the US and the USSR, which was fought with publicity and hockey instead of weapons. Thompson is one of Wendy's friends, seen back in The Inconveniencing. He was the one shooting jelly beans into his belly button. Good guy. Besides the Gravity Falls landmarks like the Mystery Shack, Tent of Telepathy, and the Water Tower, you can also spot a pixelated rendering of Stonehenge on this screen. Dipper's selection line is reminiscent of the I like shorts youngster from Pokemon. Mabel's quote here, it's a me, Maybell, is a nod to the catchphrase of Mr. Video Game himself, Mario. Stan's gameplay, which he described as I'm slower, but I jump higher, is a nod to Super Mario Bros. 2, wherein the characters each had slight platforming differences. Paul Robertson's amazing pixel art makes a return in the season 2 episode Seuss and the Real Girl. Bum this tag is only part of Seuss's dream and not actually playable? Take a seat. The Disney XD game Rumble's Revenge is available for play. Gravity Falls style. This cryptogram decodes to, sorry Dipper, but your Wendy is in another castle. Sounds like the Super Mario Brothers, thank you Mario, but our princess is in another castle. Wow, wow, wow. That was one heck of a Gravity Falls marathon. Hopefully we inspired you to marathon the show again with all sorts of new insider info. Things take on a whole new life when you've got hundreds of behind the scenes facts on deck. So what did you think of the video? Did you enjoy all these facts? Which one sticks out to you the most? Make sure you let me know down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching and remember, Frederator loves you.